One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, okay, two, three, four, five, six, one.
Hello? One, two, okay. All right. Hello, guys, let's begin. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Dr. Felix Awer, and uh, I'm the instructor for this class. So, you know, welcome to the Aerospace Engineering Capstone uh, Senior Design Symposium. Uh, this entire day, we're here to celebrate the students. Um, in my opinion, they've all really done well. Um, they've been ups and downs, some really lows, some really highs. Um, and uh, overall, um, you know, folks, you guys should be proud of this bunch we have here. Um, so a, a little context here. Uh, we have three different sections. We have the flight section that's composed of two, which is the f a fixed wing teams and the multi-role teams. The theme for their um, senior design this year was working on a management phase for disaster management. And uh, a lot of them chose hurricane um, for some reason. So we'll have those. So the fixed wing teams will go first. And then we'll have the space teams. Space teams, um, their theme was working on inflatables for the lunar surface. And you're going to see all the different ideas uh, they come up with. And then uh, the last section to go will be the uh, multi-role sections. Uh, they have 12 minutes to just give you a summary of all they've been working on since August of last year. So it's a lot they have. Now, 12 minutes is not enough for them to even tell you what they did last semester, right? But they tell you as much as what they, you know, uh, can this after uh, this morning. And then in the afternoon, we're going to have a post session and then uh, we'll ask questions. We're going to have judges come in. Uh, so this is going to be judged. And then we're going to have winners uh, uh, in the end. Okay. So uh, I want you all to enjoy the symposium and, uh, you know, just, you know, ask questions. And some of the students will be surprised at how much they know about their projects today. All right, they've been gathering this in little bits until today. So thank you for coming and uh, have a great day. We also have lunch at 1230, okay? Thank you. All right, so we're going to start with uh, DBF. Um, so thank you, guys. And uh, we'll Hello. Hello. Oh, sick. <laughs> yeah, I think it worked. All right, uh, what's up guys? We're uh, Team Wolf Airlines. Uh, we designed the Wolf Line. Well, we're with the AIAA chapter here at NC State and we're honored to be kicking off the, the fixed wing uh, presentations today. Uh, my name is Alex Elchik. I am project manager and manufacturing lead for this project. My name is Emily Heyman. I'm aerodynamics lead. I'm Rishi Ghosh and I'm the stability and controls lead. I'm Aaron Hart. I'm I'm Maya Steele and I'm the structures lead. I'm Adev Nandia and I'm the CAM stem lead. And I'm Nathan Baker. I'm the payloads lead. Awesome. So we are uh, team leads of seven seniors, so we all have our own subsystem. Um, part of the AIAA chapter here, uh, we have 18 underclassmen that also help out uh, with the project. Um, and we have weekly meetings, and then we also have our faculty advisors and uh, our section instructor. So this year's mission is to design an urban air mobility vehicle. So the, uh, it has to be able to carry um, a payload of crew, EMTs, a patient on a gurney, medical supplies, and passengers, and has to complete um, a few missions, which we'll go over uh, soon. Um, so really, that requires a urban air mobility, short takeoff and landing vehicle, and we are limited to uh, fixed wings, so no um, EV toll for this. 
So here's a concept of operations. As you can see, we've got our missions listed in the top left corner. Your mission one is going to be that airworthiness mission. Mission two is going to be your medical transport. And mission three is going to be your passenger transport. Essentially, the Wolf Line will take off within 20 feet. It'll uh, gain cruising altitude, cruise for 500 feet, do an upwind turn, cruise for 1,000 feet. Somewhere along the line, they'll do a 360-degree turn, do a downwind turn, and then land safely back on the runway. The functional block diagram you guys see here it's just showing a high-level overview of how the subsystems on the Wolf Line interact with each other. The four main subsystems include power supply, propulsion, avionics, and flight controls. One of the unique constraints given to us by DBF this year is that there needs to be two batteries on board the Wolf Line, one exclusively powering propulsion components and then one uh, powering the flight controller and control surfaces. The next is our, up is our design solution. Uh, in the top two pictures, you can see our completed Wolf Line. Left is the real life, top is the CAD, and the bottom right shows the exploded view. So we decided to go with a T-tail, high wing, uh, tail dragger, and single prop configuration for our design because we thought that this would be the best way to get our S toll. And also, uh, one of the biggest things about this uh, plane is that it's a fully composite aircraft, so everything is made out of composite materials like fiberglass and carbon fiber. So some of the main design solution parameters, uh, this table has all of them, but some of the key ones are <coughs> that we have an aspect ratio of 5.5 and a wingspan of five and 55 inches. Uh, our overall weight is 13 pounds, and we have a thrust to weight ratio of about 0.95. Uh, we have a cruising velocity of 40 miles an hour, and at this cruising velocity and at 5 degrees angle attack is our maximum L over D of 12.41. So one of the big constraints this year is that uh, it has to fit in a parking spot that is 30 inches wide. So uh, it's coming in and out of dense urban environments, so you've got to be able to store this thing on the ground. Um, so. Uh, in flight configuration, the uh, wingspan is 55 inches, and in parking configuration, we're able to get it down to 29 inches by rotating the wing. Um, in order to do this, we designed a, a rotation mount, as you can see in the bottom uh, left of that screen. Um, we have two 3D printed pieces, one attached to the wing, one attached to the fuselage, and this allows the aircraft to rotate, and it has um, a hole in the middle for wires to um, channel between wing and fuselage. It is also... Um, on top of this aluminum reinforcement plate, which is really thin, but it's able to withstand that load from the uh, wing sleeves that are on the right, which have bolts that go up underneath and um, lock in. And those wing sleeves are uh, locked onto the wing with the, uh, the spar, as you can see in that skeleton view right there. It goes right through the bolt sleeves. And um, so that prevents the wing from wanting to separate from the fuselage and gives us uh, really good structural confidence in the, the wing to fuselage. Um, so with any major project, you experience failures, and uh, we experienced failures while manufacturing our fuselage. We had, a, uh, had to do it a couple tries. So our first attempt was a positive mold. Um, you know, we put our release film on the, on the mold and all that, and uh, we you know, thought it would just pop off, but it didn't want to pop off. So uh, we tried for six hours, ended up destroying the mold on the inside, um, and then by destroying the mold, we accidentally or, uh, damaged the part. So that part was not usable after that. So, we tried the opposite thing, was to go for a negative mold. And uh, so that was a very complex layup process um, because the positive mold was much simpler because, you know, your composite's on the outside, but the composite was on the inside this time. But either due to vacuum pressure or just uh, something else, but the uh, dimensions were not reliable for the negative mold. Um, the corners did not adhere to the corners of the, uh, the mold and uh, ended up uh, not being ideal for our uh, payload. Yeah, so after all that, uh, we did end up going with the uh, positive mold, uh, just because we really needed those tight tolerances for the payload and the uh, plywood ribs, which sit inside of the fuselage. And a side effect of, that, of the positive mold is that we had to make an incision down the middle to get it off of the mold. Uh, but that ended up working out in our favor, because we actually needed that incision to get the plywood ribs in. And um, we also had a forward and aft nose and tail section, which were also made out of fiberglass, uh, laid up on a positive mold. And those are bolted onto the main section with eight bolts each. So uh, for our wing manufacturing, we decided to go with a uh, carbon fiber foam core. So essentially what we did here is we made our own um, prepreg with the uh, epoxy and carbon fiber so that we were able to lay it up over our uh, foam pieces that we cut with a CNC hot wire. And um, we were able to get uh, two channels in the, in the uh, foam core, one for the wing spar to go through and the other for wires to communicate to the different control surfaces. So before we laid it up, we put the wing rotation mount pieces in there and um, laid the carbon fiber over top of it to keep it secure. 
on the inside, giving us a super lightweight and stiff wing. Next, uh, we, next up, we have the empennage manufacturing. So just like the wing, we used the CNC hot wire cutter for our horizontal tail. But all, but separately, we did do a C, we used a CNC router to make the vertical tail because the CNC hot wire cutter does not do taper. So we made once we made all of the foam elements for the horizontal tail and vertical tail, we covered them in carbon fiber for extra rigidity. And to attach them together, we used the carbon fiber spar and put some carbon fiber on it as well to make sure that they stay in place. So a lot of the components for the avionics and propulsion came straight from the manufacturer, but the manufacturing involved a lot of wire stripping and soldering to ensure that all these uh, components could fit into each other nicely. So for the avionics and propulsion subsystem, we went ahead and used a GPS, an electronic speed controller, a flight controller, a receiver, a transmitter not pictured, a motor and batteries, servos, and then a 16 by 8 propeller, which you can see in the video. And then the video just went ahead and showed you what that integrated propulsion the avionics system looks like. And then in the bottom of the slide is just, again, that wiring diagram. So two separate batteries, one for the control surfaces and flight controller, and then another for that propulsion system. And then provided next is a breakdown of each of the payload compartments, each of them being the passenger restraint system, medical supply cabinet, patient, and gurney restraint system, and then the crew restraint system. So each of these were needed for one of the three missions we had, and then up above is the CAD models, and then the fully rendered and designed real-life models that were used and then implemented and put into the fuselage of the aircraft. So to kick off our verification and validation testing, the team wanted to construct a model in the real flight simulator. And this was basically just to assess the stability of the aircraft and the control authority in idealized conditions. So as you can see by the video, the aircraft was stable and had ample control authority from those control services. The team believes that the simulation fidelity is pretty high as the aircraft behavior during flight testing matched the predicted behavior and handling qualities we saw in real flight. The team even went so far as to recreate a crash we experienced during flight testing once mimicking the control inputs and environmental conditions in the real flight sim. Beautiful. And so after we did stability analysis, we went ahead and did aerodynamic analysis using CFD simulations. Essentially, we wanted to demonstrate the baseline characteristics that can be expected of the wolf line during our two critical phases of flight, being takeoff and cruising. Differences between those, essentially, that takeoff is going to be that 10 degrees angle of attack, and cruising is going to be 5 degrees angle of attack. You can see our results here from ANSYS Fluent, and they showed that our uh, aircraft demonstrated favorable aerodynamic characteristics throughout these two conditions of flight. All right, so we also, so we also did some physical testing. Uh, first up, we did a wing loading test on our fully manufactured wing. Uh, we covered it in 30 pounds of sand, which simulates about like a 3G hard up nose, hard nose up maneuver. And uh, the result was that the wing passed perfectly fine, uh, basically no bending because it's made of carbon fiber. And um, on top of that, it also survived multiple crashes. So uh, this was a resounding, resounding success for our wing. So next, we did a landing gear drop test. This uh, landing gear drop test in the video is about a 5G impact. And as you can see in the video, it does survive very well. There are no problems with the structure. Also, after we did some inspection, there's a little uh, shaking, but that is totally normal and totally fine to go. So we know that this aircraft is very strong and can take hard impacts. Uh, so in, another test that we did was just a taxi test to demonstrate ground controllability because you have to be able to control yourself when you're on takeoff and landing just to ensure you know you can fly the plane again afterwards. Um, so for this test, we just moved it in a straight line, turned 90 degrees, moved it in another straight line, and then turned 90 degrees again. And fun fact, this is actually the very first time we ever taxied it. So this, uh, we were proud of it because it showed how you know we kind of designed it right the first time. Um, all right, next. The next test that we did was a static thrust test using the test stand in the senior design lab. Um, from this, we hope to ensure that our plane had enough uh, thrust to take off within our design requirement of a 20-foot stole land, stole takeoff. Um, from the testing, we discovered that we had around 13 pounds of thrust, which was much higher than what we uh, got from our calculations. So here's our first flight test. I'll let you all uh, take a look at it. So uh, you, can't, you can't control everything. So what happened there was uh, a giant uh, gust of crosswind ended up ha happened on the takeoff roll and uh, ended up crashing the plane. But due to our manufacturing and us selecting a composite, um, there was no damage to critical structure. The only damage that occurred there was a little bit to the landing gear and to the propeller. So here's flight test number two where we drove it out to an actual runway. 
So uh, as you can see, it's uh, going down. Um, <laughs> the, uh, what happened there was a uh, little bit, we need to adjust elevator trim for takeoff. So now we know. Um, we, uh, we learn from every crash right here. So uh, it was able to take off, but it had a steep nose up angle, which caused it to lose airspeed super fast. Um, that caused it to stall in the air, and uh, it was unable to uh, recover since it was so low. So, uh, yeah, so in conclusion, we uh, designed an aircraft that is an urban air mobility vehicle that has been through the design process multiple times. And in the coming days, we'll be conducting further flight testing to ensure the airworthiness of this aircraft. But after viewing our flight test, we're pretty confident that we can get up in the air and control the Wolf Line. Uh, this was a really fun project to do for our senior capstone, and thank you all for listening. Test, test. Test, test, test. Test, test. One for this side. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. We are Team Soar, and we are excited to present our project, Skimmer. And this is what our presentation is going to look like. First, we're going to introduce ourselves, go into a quick description of our project, introduce you our design solution, show how we manufacture uh, Skimmer, and then showcase a few tests where we verified and validated some of the capabilities of Skimmer, and then we'll wrap it up with a nice conclusion. My name is Rumare Pelokasada. I'm the project manager and CAD and simulation lead of this team. I'm Pranav. I'm the communications lead and the aerodynamics lead. I'm Haley Bruce. I'm the manufacturing lead and structures lead. I'm Emily Hughes. I'm the financial lead and propulsion lead. Hi, I'm Victor. I'm the system engineer and the payload and avionics lead. I'm Taimur Chaudhary. I'm the stability and control and test and safety lead. And here's a slide that kind of shows all who was involved into this project. Of course, it lists us and our roles and also shows our, our course instructor, Dr. Wary, our section instructor, Joseph Denicky, and our project customers who helped us all along the way. Moving on to our project description, our purpose was to design and manufacture a fixed wing UAV that functioned as a water surveying platform in the preparation and recovery phases of hurricanes. This project is important because hurricanes are still devastating and unpredictable natural disasters that can be better understood through testing of things like water quality, carbon flux, uh, sediment transport, dissolved organic matter, and other properties of bodies of water. Our goals beyond just designing and building this craft include having it run on clean energy sources, collect water samples of course, um, collect surveillance images, and otherwise support these responses. Our objectives, the essential parts of this project, include the remote control ability for this UAV as well as LiPo battery power, a weight limit of 20 pounds, dimensions no larger than 3 by 5 by 2 feet, um, controlled stable flight following a hand launch, line of sight piloting, an endurance of 15 minutes, and full payload operation with imaging, flight data, and those water samples. So in order to get a good um, comparison of the water samples and imaging feed, we have two phases of our mission for Skimmer. So there's the preparation phase for hurricanes and the recovery phase for hurricanes. And with each one, we have different sets of uh, inherent risks. So in the preparation phase for the hurricane, um, we'll be using 
the hurricane cone prediction provided by the National Hurricane Center as close as possible to the day of projected landfall, and the skimmer will um, be launched by two operators uh, on that day, and it will be fly over uh, like a body of water, like an estuary or a river, and it will collect, uh, it will take video feed and send it to a ground station operator, and it will, at one point, it will go down to the body of water and collect a water sample, at which point it will come back up and it will land, and we, the water sample will be collected. And then the recovery phase, um, because this happens post-hurricane, there are increased, as close as possible post-hurricane, there will be increased risks of uh, high gust loading, water debris interference, um, and precipitation. So all of these are risks that need to be accounted for. So here's a functional block diagram for, our, for Skimmer. Uh, this diagram shows all the systems, subsystems, and the components within, and how they interact with each other with different types of signals. The UAV consists of the control system, propulsion system, uh, power supply, control surfaces, and payload. And they all uh, communicate with the ground control, which consists of a transceiver and the flight controller operated by the pilot. Next, we'll go over the design solution for Skimmer. So after multiple iterations of design, we arrived at the configuration that you can see. It is a rectangular wing with a conventional tail. Um, and the dimensions that we chose satisfied our propulsion and our civilian control needs. On the bottom left, you can see a table with some of our more important parameters, such as a 15-minute endurance, one-mile range, with a 7% static margin, which is important for stability. So moving on to the payload, as mentioned before, the two main goals of Skimmer is to be able to take high quality images of wet and dry terrain and to be able to collect half a cup of water or around 100 grams of water. So the first goal, super easy, just slap a camera on there, turn it on, and then if your plane is stable, pictures are going to turn out fine. However, when we were going to collect the water, we decided to go for a unique, non-conventional way where we decided that in order to collect the water, we were going to use a high-powered vacuum. And to reach the water, we were going to deploy a carbon tube, which acts as our, our collection tube, into the water as skimmer is skimming, hence the name, across the water at its cruising speed. And that 55 kilogram servo that you see on that diagram uh, enables to not only deploy, but to be able to maintain that connection into the water without the carbon tube bouncing back up or otherwise damaging the, uh, excuse me, the plane. Moving on to the manufacturing phase of Skimmer. Most of the components that we needed to assemble and manufacture Skimmer were either laser cut or 3D printed. All the wood components, as mentioned, of the fuselage, the wing, and the empennage were laser cut, and you can see me operating the machine at the entrepreneurship garage. Uh, the rest of the components, including the mounts, uh, the wing box, and the empennage box were laser, uh, 3D printed. Uh, we used PLA filament for most of it, except for the wing box, for which we used ABS to give it the most structural integrity possible. The following slides are dedicated to our various subsystem tests. Propulsion testing <laughs> was intended to determine the amount of thrust our system was able to produce and check the compatibility of the components listed to the right and ensure that we had installed them properly and were using them properly. Um, through static thrust testing, we determined our maximum available thrust was 15 pounds at full throttle. A, um, our thrust to weight ratio as a result was 1.16, which is very high and we had a flight endurance of approximately 15 minutes conservatively.
windows on the bottom surface of the wing. Um, these loads were consistent with our flight envelope diagram. So it's like a velocity versus load factor diagram. Basically the maximum load that we are expect a uh, swimmer to achieve, whether it be from uh, gust loads or um, fast turns or short turns. Um, so the, the highest load factor we determined was 3.8 Gs. And so we loaded the bottom surface of the swimmer with sandbags uh, in order to simulate this load, as you can see. And the maximum deflection uh, we achieved was three eighths of an inch, and there was no detrimental distortion, no uh, no static deformation, or yeah, no deformation of the wing. So it was a success. So to ensure the stability of skimmer, we've carried out a physical determination of the CG location as well as an AVL um, analysis for the dynamic stability. On the top right, you can see skimmer being mounted on two scales at the front and at the back. This was plugged into an online eCal calculator. The advantage of this was it told us initial ballast we might need to use to adjust the CD, lo CD location. On the bottom, you can see a plot of the eigenvalues for the uh, dynamic stability, and you can see that for the most part, the longitudinal and the lateral modes were all satisfied, apart from the spiral stability, which is uh, expectedly unstable. And so for Skimmer's goal of collecting water, we really wanted to see two things. One, is the vacuum powerful enough to collect water from that height? And so the test that we used to conduct, the, the test that we conducted to prove that and to test that is this water sample collection test. You can see the diagram of how we calculated the mechanical power. And in the next slide is the video of us actually performing the test. And you can see that it's successful. And so here's me loading the cup of water at the bottom where the, it's going to be collected. And then you'll see here in a few moments the water actually trailing through the pipe and entering skimmer on the left side where the collection chamber is. The other idea that we wanted to prove is that can our 55 kilogram servo withstand the impact from the water as skimmer is going across the water? As a reminder, the deployment tube is going to go into that water, so the moment created by the water is going to be really high. And we want to make sure that the servo that we have is going to bounce back, is going to break. And so we devised this deployment servo load test where I simulated that load with a uh, bag that's put into a uh, bag that's filled with sandbags loaded at the tip of the collection tube where we expect the water to be collected, of course. And then with that load, we can calculate what's the simulated load, at what speed. And here is a video of the test of us conducting it. And we can see that when we loaded the sandbags, the servo experienced little deflection, or the collection tube experienced little deflection and was able to maintain that weight, giving us confidence that if this were to be actually deployed into the water, it would perform as expected. And there you can see it deflected just half an inch, and it maintained that for the duration of the test. In conclusion, this product is going to be very applicable in the preparation and recovery phases of hurricanes to collect that valuable data of water samples and to uh, take high quality image of the wet and dry terrain to be, to be sent to first responders so they can you know, use that highly valuable information in their missions. And looking forward, we have a flight test this Saturday, not this one day, I apologize for the uh, inaccuracy. We did do a flight test earlier, about two weeks ago. It was unsuccessful for a multitude of reasons. AIAA mentioned that there was a lot of gusts that day. It was very, very windy that day. And there are some things that have to be worked on, such as, you know, um, the landing gear has to be corrected. There's, there's a few things here or there, but we are, the plane was fixed, and we are looking forward to fly this Saturday. That is all. Thank you so much for listening, and we're ready for questions. Next team. Next team.
Peter right now in the full box. Most of them's young. This is why. Yo, I'm gonna introduce myself first after the first slide. Yeah. And then uh, hand it off to the rest. Yeah. Um, I think he said that one's for him. I'm Reed Garcelon. I'm the CAD and simulation lead and manufacturing lead. I'm Alex Dutter. I'm the stability and control lead and the financial lead. I'm Hedy Sabah, the aerodynamics lead and presentation lead. Uh, I'm Eve Fulton, the structures lead and communications lead. So to overview our project, our goal was to design and manufacture a fixed-wing unmanned aerial system uh, to aid search and rescue teams in natural disasters. And we our goal was to assist in that by providing live camera footage of the area being surveyed, all the while um, being able to transmit the GPS location uh, of the aircraft and those people. Uh, some of our goals for our project was for Abe to be hand-launched and easy to pilot, uh, for it to fly over a significant portion of the disaster area, and to facilitate a more efficient disaster relief process. So at the beginning of the uh, project design, we set out some objectives based on the project's requirements for three levels of success. Uh, notably is uh, hand launchability, endurance and range, and ground communication. Uh, based on our feasibility analysis and our verification tests, we meet or exceed the level one requirements for all of our project objectives. This is our uh, CONOPS diagram for Abe's mission of post-disaster relief. So first, the pilot and operator will be at the ground station. And the pilot will control the transmitter while the operator stands by for hand launch. The UAS will then be hand launched by the operator and will reach the appropriate altitude for our mission with a ceiling of 400 feet. The aircraft will then reach a flooded disaster area and loiter, gathering geospatial data of civilians in danger with an RGB camera. The UAS will then return to the ground station while transmitting the civilian location to the ground station. And it will finally travel back to the ground station after an operation time of about 15 minutes. So here's our design solution for Abe. On the left uh, shows our assembly, and on the right is an isometric view of the 3D CAD model. So here's an exploded view uh, labeled for all of our parts. Uh, we have a twin boom design connected by the horizontal tail and each with their own vertical tail. We have a uh, rectangular truss structure for the fuselage and a foam core for the wings with a single monospar. Here are also the geometric specifications of Abe. Uh, we concluded these geometric specifications uh, using x 5 Flightstream, and AVL to meet our mission design requirements. Uh, and the general geometry that we want to highlight here is the aspect ratio having 7.2, span of 5.9 feet, uh, wing area of 4.7 feet squared, and a taper ratio of 1. And also here are the system specifications of the, the UAS that we created. We had a wing airfoil of NACA 4414, a horizontal tail and fin airfoil of NACA 0012, and a CL alpha of 4.77 radians, and a thrust to weight ratio of 0 0.86. So here's a functional block diagram of the entire UAS. You can see that the pilot will be inputting control into the radio transmitter, which will be received by the receiver and input into the flight controller. From there, uh, control inputs will be distributed out to the ESC, which will throttle the motor, and out to the servos, which will control the control surfaces. And all this is being powered by a lithium ion battery through a power module. And here's a more detailed version of the avionics specifically. And as you can see, the flight controller is the hub of the entire system. And that's inputting the telemetry data through an SIK telemetry radio out to our uh, ground control. 
Now we'll talk about the evidence of feasibility for propulsion as well as stability and control. So first for propulsion on the left, we have various, uh, various plots of propulsion parameters. Um, given our cruise speed of 58 feet per second, we were able to get estimates of available power as well as endurance and range and rate of climb at our flight speed. Uh, the results of this show that our aircraft has enough available power um, to maneuver in flight as well as satisfy our lower level requirements for endurance and range. And on the right is our stability analysis uh, conducted in Athena Vortex Lattice um, as well as flight stream. Um, on the bottom is the model used to do this in AVL and on the top is the uh, parameters that it spat out. Um, most notably the um, CM alpha is negative uh, indicating a positive uh, pitch longitudinal stability and CL beta and CN beta are negative and positive respectively uh, indicating roll and yaw stiffness are both positive. And to make sure that uh, Abe meets our mission design requirements at least aerodynamically we created a high fidelity CFD model and as you can see here by the flow chart this is how we conducted it. We created a mesh of the CAD model, made sure that the mesh meets our meshing criteria, like a Y plus value of less than one, make sure the boundary layer is accurately recognized, and then we see design requirements, if they are met or not, and if they, if they are, we post-process the results. And here's a chart that shows how this was conducted. So as you can see here, we had a Y plus value of 0 0.37, so the boundary layer was accurate, uh, accurately represented uh, with this uh, CFD model, and you can see the mesh of the UAS as well. And after that, we post-process the path line visualization at trim angle of attack to make sure that there's no flow separation occurring at any point at the UAS. And we also benchmarked ANSYS against XLR5 flight stream uh, to make sure that there's not uh, a large discrepancy between those results. However, we were expecting some discrepancies in drag since uh, ANSYS fluent um, takes into consideration the viscous effects. All right, so for our structural feasibility, we did a MATLAB analysis on the SPAR um, and we were looking at the, stress, the stresses and deflection of it. And then we did FEA on the wings and booms at 1 and 2.5 Gs. Um, and all of our factors, factors of safety were within a reasonable limit. So um, here's our manufacturing process. Kind of tells a story from the top left to the bottom right. Uh, first, we used the hot wire CNC to cut our wing sections out of XPS foam. Um, and then the top middle is the uh, wing boom spar assembly. It really shows the rigidity of the aircraft um, in its skeletal form um, and how the boom, or the, the spar connects through each boom. Um, and then on the top right is the truss and uh, wings all put together. And in the bottom left is the, uh, uh, one of the wings getting laid up with carbon fiber. We did a two ply, uh, two by two twill for the carbon fiber. Um, and then the last two are just some of the more finishing uh, touches, uh, putting everything together in the, in the middle and then the whole avionic system in that uh, truss system. And here is our final product. Um, this is Abe. Um, so we did have manufacturing challenges, of course. Um, our first thing was hinging the control surfaces. Uh, we wanted to kind of conceal that and do carbon or um, fiberglass tape underneath the carbon fiber. Um, and that proved a little difficult when dremeling out the hinges for that. It kind of just cut the carbon fiber and, uh, and the fiberglass. Um, of course, there were parts of material shipping delays. And then our biggest challenge was our foam welder vacuum pressure combination. We used Super 77 foam welder to connect the uh, wing sections. Um, and when we did our carbon fiber layups, the vacuum pressure uh, collapsed one of our spar channels and uh, we had to do a carbon fiber patch on top of that. Uh, and then also we control horn attachment points was a and is a big deal still. Here's a list of the verification tests we performed to make sure that it would be flight worthy. As you can see uh, most of them were completed near the end of February and those were mainly the aerodynamic and structural tests. However, we completed uh, the rest of them, the propulsion and the avionics test uh, near the beginning of March. So we've had three flight tests, all within a week of each other in the end of March. Um, they all ended with crashes. 
um, but it plays to our manufacturability and repairability of our UAS um, that we, within four days and five days, we're able to repair and try again. Um, we've learned something critical from each one, and we are planning on 13 April to fly again and expect it to fly. And here's our budget breakdown. Uh, we were allotted uh, $1,500 from the Engineering Trust Fund, um, and we spent uh, about $1,400 of it. Um, originally, it was about 1200 and then re repair costs and replacements um, ended us up with about $100 left. So to sum up, uh, while we weren't able to get our successful flight test just yet, Abe does, in fact, meet all the static design requirements uh, while staying under budget, uh, said at the beginning of the fall semester. Um, we're confident that our feasibility research and the verification testing that we've performed will prove that Abe uh, will, in fact, fly uh, this Saturday, uh, the 13th, um, based on uh, changes we've made to the design, such as an increased propeller size um, and a shift in um, mass distribution, as well as uh, much favorable flight conditions, as I'm sure the rest of the teams will know. Um, but yeah, um, we really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you. Next team. Just this one? Yeah. All right. Testing. I'm probably going to go first. So. Uh, it's a bias. Just as he does the intro. Go. One mic. We have to use the door. I will sit down to you guys. Two minutes. Okay. Please use the mic. People are online listening to you. Uh, okay. You can use the two ball. Mic check. Do we have another mic or is this just the one? This was the one. You could probably use. Well, yeah. You guys can share that, but maybe someone should be stationed here. I think three of us can share this. You guys can share this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you want to stay on that one? There was. I think one of them wasn't working. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully this one works. Um, let me switch with you, so you three can use that one. Okay. That's awkward. Okay. Good. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are Team Reacher, and today we're going to be presenting our senior design project, Hero One. It's a reconnaissance and emergency aircraft for critical hurricane relief. Uh, my name is Tobias Hullett. I am the project manager and structures lead. I'm Brian, the aerodynamics lead and financial lead. I'm Caleb Cabetti, a com communications lead and propulsion lead. I'm Sebastian Perna, I'm Test and Safety Lead and Stability and Controls Lead. I'm Jose Viscarando, I'm the Systems Engineer and the Payload and Avionics Lead. And I'm Lucas Andrews, I'm the Manufacturing and CAD Simulation Lead. And there's a picture of Freddie, he wasn't able to make it today. Uh, here's an overview of our project. Um, basically we're trying to build a multi-purpose UAV that helps hurricane responders um, respond more efficiently and effectively. Uh, we're proposing a UAV with float capabilities and VTOL capabilities where it's able to take off and land on water, uh, survey areas, find stranded individuals, and provide them with communication and supplies. Uh, here's an illustration of what a typical Hero One mission looks like. First, it'll start by being assembled by a two-person crew on the ground where it can take off vertically from either water or land, at which point it will reach its loiter altitude, which is uh, 400 feet. After that, it will deploy its sensors. It'll have a series um, of infrared sensors and cameras to locate trapped individuals, and it'll be able to relay that, that data back to the ground station, and from the ground station, we'll be able to relay that data to um, rescuers. After it's done collecting important information, it's able to return and vertically land on water or on land for refitting. This is um, an overview of the functional block diagram. It contains all the systems and subsystems on Hero One, um, starting with the transmitter, um, where the pilot will 
input its, uh, his commands. From that point, it will go to the flight controller, and from the flight controller, go to the servos and motors. Here's a very quick overview of our design solution. There's a lot here. Uh, you can see it kind of looks like a boat. We have a very high volume hull so that it can land and float on water. Um, and we have three motors. The front two motors um, can rotate forward and up. Um, all three together work for vertical takeoff and landing. And then once it gets up to altitude, the front two rotate forward and it transitions into a cruise flight. Um, we took advantage of lots of lightweight materials like carbon fiber and balsa wood and foam and hollowed out as many volumes as we could um, to save on weight. Uh, the last thing to note is that we have outrigger floats on the wings for lateral stability in water. Uh, this is a table going over some of the most important specifications for our design. Uh, most importantly, our plane had, our assembly had an all-up weight of around 20 pounds, although it's slightly over right now. Um, we had a wingspan of 10 feet. Uh, we had a thrust to weight in hover about 1.4 and about 1 while we're in cruise flight. And lastly, we used RDPilot as our flight controller. Um, now moving on to some of our manufacturing, uh, beginning with the fuselage. Uh, we had a wooden rib interior, which was constructed using laser cutting. Then a foam exterior constructed with a mix of hot wiring, CNC, and epoxy to hold it all together. Uh, for waterproofing, uh, in the painting phase, we began with two layers of primer to keep the foam safe. Then flex seal to seal up all of the cracks and keep water from leaking in. Touched it up with a little bit of red paint and that pretty logo you see there. Uh, next up for the wing, uh, we have fairly similar process where we started off with wooden ribs. These also acted as templates so we could use to hot wire the wing. Um, you can see that in the second image. Uh, after that, we had to cut out some additional foam so that we could create the mounts uh, from the wing to the tail boom. We also had some 3D prints from the tail boom to the tail surfaces. And then after that, we uh, attached them all together using epoxy and we uh, applied a carbon fiber layout. So this is the uh, avionics manufacturing. And for the most part, it was plug and play. Um, first, we started with the flight controller, soldering on the pins and actually updating the firmware. Since we are a forward flight aircraft and a VTOL aircraft, that was kind of a little um, difficult to do, but we were able to do that. Um, after we updated the firmware, we went ahead and installed the different sensor systems, which consists of the airspeed sensor, the GPS, and the transmitter. After that, we went over to the mechanical systems, installed those which included servos for all the tilting systems and also for the ailerons. And lastly, we installed the motors and tuned those as well. Uh, for the propulsion system, uh, mainly it was just soldering for connections onto the flight controller and onto the motors. Um, the only piece that needed manufacturing was the motor mount. Uh, besides that, it was just screwing and bolting. For the control surfaces, the ailerons and rotovators were cut out of the existing wing and tail, then epoxied on via a piece of hinge tape. Um, the tilt rotors for, or the gearbox for the tilt rotors were designed by Tobias and then 3D printed with tough 1500 resin. And then the servo holes were cut out and attached with a piece of Velcro and covered with aluminum tape. Uh, when we put everything together, here's our full assembly. Uh, this is a picture from one of our flight uh, days. Um, but before we were actually able to fly it, uh, fly it we uh, uh, tested each of the subsystems. Uh, starting off with aerodynamics, uh, since we didn't ha have access to a wind tunnel, we could only do some ANSYS fluent testing. Uh, so the goal of this was to verify that uh, the data matched what we expected from the previous semester. And out of three levels, this test got a level three uh, criteria where we had a, cr a stall speed of less than 30 miles per hour. Since the manufacturing was going to take quite some time and we wanted to get some electrical tests done, we decided to do an Iron Bird test, which is a simulation of what the aircraft's going to look like. That's that picture to the right, I think. And um, using the Iron Bird rig, we were able to test the tilting mechanisms. We were able to test the airspeed sensors, the GPS, and the camera, which streamlined everything for once the actual aircraft was done. We were able to just plug everything in. With the Iron Bird test, we were able to get a level three success criteria, which um, everything worked as expected. 
A static thrust test was also done to evaluate the thrust to weight ratio. Um, after doing this, a thrust to weight ratio of 1.46 1.46 was calculated, which equates to around a 30 pound um, thrust value across all three of our motors. For the stability and controls test, we conducted a CG determination test just to verify the center of gravity. Um, this reached a level three success criteria being three inches behind the leading edge of the wing, which gave a static margin of 25.7%. Then for the control surfaces, we did a throw test to verify that they had adequate deflection. Um, this reached a level two success criteria as they, each of the control surfaces deflected at least 15 degrees in under half a second. Um, moving on to some of our structural testing, uh, most of this was focused on the wing, as that is our uh, most key structural component. Uh, we began with simulations using uh, FEA, and also did that coupled with a physical wing loading test, both of these reaching uh, the at least the level one requirement with the wing loading test actually showing that our uh, simulations were very, very conservative. Um, showing a maximum deflection of four inches at the wingtip, which was acceptable for what we needed to do to fly. Uh, along with this, we also did water testing as we were planning to uh, have the aircraft ready for water operations. We did static, dynamic, and also a drop test along with this, uh, all of which were very successful reaching level two or level three requirements. Here's a quick video showing our hover test. Um, this is actually a successful hover test. It's done in um, manual mode, so I'm actually controlling the, the hover stability of the aircraft at this time. Um, initially, one of the challenges we ran into was that our tilting uh, servo in the rear, which controlled our yaw, was a little bit too slow. So um, our first hover test, we actually spun out of control. Fortunately, we didn't crash too hard and didn't damage anything but we ended up adding some derivative control and we were able to get um, stability on the yaw axis. Thankfully, with our hover test, we didn't have to worry about too bad of a crash. We'd go up and come right back down. It's when we tried transitioning to cruise flight that we had uh, some issues. So the first flight test day, we did a hand launch and the winds were crazy and we crashed. Uh, thankfully, we were able to rebuild in a week um, later, we were able to achieve successful cruise flight and successful transition from VTOL to cruise flight. Um, again, rough landing. Uh, that's just going to take some practice, but we were able to rebuild in a week. And here are some images showing our successful flight. And this is an actual video. Here I take off vertically. We have pretty bad winds. The winds are kind of taking me there. And then I just decide to go with the wind. And right about there is where I transition. Lost a little bit of altitude, but I was able to recover. And now it's in the middle of transitioning. So while it's transitioning, the rotors only move forward to 45 degrees until it reaches sufficient airspeed to go into forward flight. And now it's, it's, flying, it's flying like a dream. It flew really well. It was really controllable. The, the only downside, it was very windy that day. So that kind of uh, made it hard <laughs> to fly. And with a similar prompt to senior design, um, the Reacher UAS was submitted to NASA Gateway to Blue Skies. Um, we applied a more detailed concept of operations and more advanced reconnaissance technologies. Um, happily, we were selected and we will be going to Ames Research Center to present in May. Overall, uh, over the past seven months, even with the $1,500 budget, we've been able to design and build a beast of an airplane and it's able to float, uh, hover, and fly. And so we believe that the combination of these three modes um, will help revolutionize hurricane response systems here in North Carolina and around the world. Uh, thank you to Dr. Wary and Joseph for all your help this semester and customers for all your guidance and questions. Uh, it's great to be a part of this project. Next team. <laughs> Is this a little, a little quicker? Is this a little quicker? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you
So actually, um, I think we'll be fine. yeah, because people are online listening to you, and uh, yeah. Hello, man. Okay, you can maybe project to this. Okay, this works. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. Works. So we have two minutes to go. I will. Please project. Okay. Sorry, sorry everybody, sorry everybody. I'm Alex Strahan, Manufacturing Lead and Stability Controls Lead. I'm Bryce Potter, the Financial Lead and the Captain Simulation Lead. And I'm Madeline Hebert, I'm the Test and Safety Lead and Propulsion Lead. Uh, this is just the organization structure, uh, same thing from last slide, uh, as well as it introduces our customers and core uh, business structures. This is our project description. The purpose of this project is to create a, an unmanned aerial system that can accurately collect data necessary for hurricane analysis post-disaster, in addition to re relaying that information to first responders. These are our project goals. Our vehicle will be easily deployable and require minimal human support. Uh, it will be powered by a clean energy source. It will be able to capture detailed images of inaccessible areas, and it will collect accurate flood and tidal data. These are our objectives. Our UAS shall be hand-launched uh, from above, above head level. It shall have a successful landing with minimal damages. Uh, it shall be able to uh, take and store images. Uh, it shall be able to uh, cruise for uh, at least 10 minutes. And all subsystems shall be powered by batteries. This is our concept of operation. To first be begin with assembly, uh, the UAS will then be hand launched and climbed to a specified altitude, not exceeding 400 feet. It will then fly to the area of interest where it will loiter and collect data. After relaying that information back to the ground station, it will return, descend, land at the area of launch, uh, and then we will then recover the UAS and hold a debrief. This is our functional block diagram. It's a high level overview of our system and system components. Uh, the pilot will always be in line of sight of the aircraft. Their inputs are sent to the RC receiver in our avionics hub. We have a single large LiPo battery powering all subsystems on our aircraft. This includes propulsion, avionics, as well as all of our, all of our actuators for the control surfaces. And our payload is just our camera. This is our electronics functional block diagram. Just going in a little bit more detail here about the avionics systems and all their connections. So this is the first look at the design solution for Stormrunner. So what you can see here, just like a high level specifications, is a 15 inch uh, two bladed wooden propeller, a eight foot total wingspan, which is split into multiple sections and will be elaborated in a, more in a further slide. We are rolling with the tail dragger configuration as seen by those three wheels in a conventional T-tail um, situation. So for the CAD model, we couple of those dimensions I already talked about. We have the eight foot wingspan, which can be seen in the right image, as well as the 15 inch propeller and a 20 inch horizontal tail. A couple of other important dimensions include the overall length of Storm Runner being just over three feet long and the vertical tail being at seven inches. So taking a look at the exploded view of Storm Runner, we can see the split section of those wings. So we have three distinct section of these wings. They're made of a foam core with a fiberglass layup. Um, these are have a carbon spar running through the middle. And the reason for these separate wing sections is to fit the customer specifications as the eight foot wingspan does not fit within that five foot box. 
So taking into these different sections allows us to fit into that. Additionally, this connects to the structure of Stormrunner with a 3D printed PLA filament plate, which is mounted using hardware and other screws. And this mounts directly to the semi-monocoque birch structure. So this structure can be seen in the bottom part of the image and is supported with additional PLA filament hole supports. So these hole supports provide additional rigidity and connection points for the various applications of Stormrunner, being the, the wing and the empennage as well as the landing gear. These are just some very basic system overview metrics of the Stormrunner. We do come in under that 20 pound weight limit at just around 11 pounds. Um, as Bryce mentioned, we do have an eight foot wingspan and then our motor produces a 0.8 to one thrust to weight ratio and these are just some additional metrics about our propulsion systems and otherwise. So moving on to our manufacturing here, uh, this is where we really started to see what we could actually build compared to what we designed. Um, and that, that really comes into play here when uh, manufacturing the wings, the initial design or the thought process behind that uh, was to get that CNC cut. I mean, the wings have tapers, so it, it, it's hard to make sure that the entire airfoil is consistent over the whole thing. Uh, so the way that worked is the top and the bottom half were both designed. Uh, they were both CNC cut. And then the thought process was to dremel out a spar cut out in the middle glue those together and then end up wrapping the whole thing in fiberglass. Uh, this went really well at first until we actually went to cut it out of the foam. It ended up being really uh, inconsistent along the trailing edge, which is bad for the airflow that we wanted. Uh, so we ended up switching gears. Uh, we went with a CNC hot wire cut. Well, not CNC, but it was hot wire cut. Uh, basically two um, stencils on either side of the wing sections. Uh, then we were able to put that on the hot wire and we were able to cut that out uh, really well. And as you can see on the picture on the right there, the, uh, the trailing edge, leading edge, the entire wing profile looked really good when it was all laser cut or uh, wire cut. Uh, that being said, the empennage, so the tail configuration was the exact same way. Uh, important note here too is that the control surfaces like the elevator, the rudder, the aileron were not cut out of the hot wire cut wings. Uh, that was actually after we did the fiberglass, we were just able to cut that out and uh, integrate that with some fiberglass tape. Uh, so here's some more pictures, kind of the vacuum bagging process, um, you know, cutting out the, the spar cutout. And then as for the fuselage too, uh, you can kind of see in that top picture, uh, the entire thing was uh, laser cut. It was all birch wood. Um, then was, that was all wood glued together. Um, and then we have a fiberglass belly on the whole thing. Uh, this was for rigidity's sake. It's a little bit different from our actual design solution because the design solution featured the entire thing being wrapped in fiberglass. But we went with this, it was a lot easier and we weren't sure we were gonna be able to keep the same shape across the entire fuselage. So with that being said, uh, once everything was integrated, it was wrapped in a fire layer, final layer of monocoat. Uh, this was to ensure steady airflow across the whole thing. And then as for those two pictures on the right right there, uh, that's the avionics, that's all put together. So you can see the battery, the ESC, all the wiring kinda leads into that center part of the entire aircraft. Um, and as for the servos, those back two servos, they all lead to this center. And then the, uh, the aileron servos, which are the two on the side, actually stick out of the aircraft. They go along the wing and everything kind of comes together in that middle. And uh, that when ends up leading to a completed design. So pretty much everything just went over. Wings, uh, empennage, they were either CNC cut or hot wire cut. Uh, the ribs and stringers are the fuselage, laser cut. Hull supports in nose cone, uh, those are 3D printed. And then as for the skin, it was either fiberglass or it was that monocoat. Uh, for the landing gear, the brackets that we used for those were actually water jet. They're completely metal, except for the actual extension of the landing gear, which is a carbon fire layup with wood in the middle. And as for the avionics, that was either soldered on or it was, it was a wire connection. Either way, it all leads back to that whole kind of brain in the middle there. So this is just a quick budget breakdown. Um, you can see in the column that says estimated cost, that was our predicted cost in the fall, what we thought it was going to create or take to manufacture the Stormrunner. We ended up being $200 over that, but still under that $1,500 um, budget due to, as Alex mentioned, we did have to redo our wings and then other manufacturing issues that arose caused incurable cost. Um, you can see the on the right, the pie chart does a quick breakdown per component of how we spent our money, with most of our money going to our motor, our battery, and other elements of our avionics. So this is our final prototype. This is Stormrunner before she flew. Uh, there's a couple other differences here between the design solution and the actual manufactured prototype. You can see in that top um, left photo, there's a U-shaped 
black piece of carbon fiber that was used to connect the elevator so that one servo could be used to control both sides. In addition, we did have to add a strut to our landing gear going horizontally as after manufacturing our carbon fiber landing gear arms, there was a bunch of flex once they were actually attached to the aircraft. So adding that for additional rigidity was beneficial. Also, we noticed that our CG location was off from where our AVL had predicted. So we did have to add about a pound and a half of weight to the nose cone to give a better static margin. Our flight test outcome, we did attempt to fly multiple times. On the first day, as aforementioned, there was a bunch of wind. So we did achieve flight for a very brief period, as you can see in that above image. And then we did have a hard landing where we snapped one of our landing gear connections on the left side. So we did have to go back to the lab and we moved from doing that foam core with the carbon fiber to a wood core with carbon fiber to allow a better structural rigidity. On the second day, there was even stronger winds. So we did have another crash landing after achieving more flight for a couple of seconds. And then we had a backup propeller because that was what broke on our crash landing. And we did attempt over and over again to fly, but were unsuccessful ultimately. So a couple of our lessons learned from this whole process is that planning is really key. You set yourself up in the fall for success in the spring. Uh, test as your progress is made instead of doing it all at the end. It doesn't allow enough time to reconvene and fix things as they need to. Ask a bunch of questions. Um, the people here and your time is your most valuable resources. Um, so for our benefit to customer, um, there's a positive impact uh, to first responders. A lot of times the satellite imagery available to them is generally pretty low quality. Um, and then sending manned aircraft in the sky puts human lives at risk uh, in those situations. Um, our solution rectifies both, both of those issues. Um, our design's pretty low cost. Uh, by remaining under budget, we allowed ourselves some leeway um, for repairs after flight test. Um, but from a solution standpoint, this allows us to make improvements uh, in some areas. Um, our solution is also pretty versatile. Um, it can be modified to accommodate a wide range of missions from recreational to payload delivery. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you to the uh, MAE department for their guidance uh, from a high level uh, standpoint, uh, and also to the instructors for answering questions at a system level. Uh, also, thank you to some of the teams. Um, we, I think, grew. Yeah, thank you. Next team. We have two minutes to go. I will do it. Okay. We have two minutes to go. That's it. We have 12 minutes, right? Yeah, 12. Well, we have to do this. Do we need to screw down more or are y'all good? There's seven of us. I put the fourth person in the middle. Where's the person? John, do you want to be in the middle? It's too late. I think it's John. They forced me over here. All right, so we are Team Ballooner Eclipse, and we will be presenting our Ballooner Tower today. Uh, just a quick presentation outline. We will introduce ourselves. We'll go down the line. Uh, we'll give you a quick project overview. We'll show you our design solution in our CAD of each sub subsystem. Uh, we'll go quickly over manufacturing. We will show in depth our manufacturing, or sorry, verification and validation testing, and we will show you our inflatable test. I'm Eduardo. I'm the design lead. I'm Aaron Crow. I'm the test and safety lead. I'm Ethan Davenport, and I'm the system engineer. Uh, I'm John Gillespie. I'm the project manager. I'm Sammy Graff. I'm the communications liaison. I'm Connor. I'm the manufacturing lead. And I'm Estaltz, and I'm the financial lead. So this is our organizational chart. Um, you see how it's kind of broken down here. 
Uh, I'd like to give thanks to Matthew, Dr. Ware, and our customer, Dr. Ware. So first up, just a little background of what the Ballooner Tower's mission is. So we were given the task of making something inflatable to help with um, lunar research. So we decided to come up with a, we don't have a lot of communication on the far side of the moon right now. So we created a tower that will help with that communication and these towers can be placed wherever you want on the moon and can be used to relay information and data um, between towers and uh, to different satellites. So with all that being said, the Ballooner Tower will be able to provide reliable communication um, for data to be transmitted. It can inflate and deflate whenever desired um, to allow for easy movability. And with that, everything can shrink down into one storage box um, so that astronauts can put them on rovers and they can be deployed in that way. So here's a little bit of our overall concept of operations. Um, as you can see, first up we have the launch. So the um, Ballooner Tower will be loaded onto Artemis. Um, it will be launched from Earth. It'll go into transit to Gateway. It'll dock on Gateway. Once it's there, it'll land on the moon. Um, astronauts can then put it onto rovers and drive them to the different locations that they would like to deploy the towers. Um, at that point, activation can be completed and the towers can be expanded and transmission of data can be started. So here's a little bit of con ops for our actual tower. We have a few main structures that I want to go over. So first off, we have our expandable tower structure. This is the rigid structure that provides some, like I said, rigidity and structure to our tower. Um, this is made out of telescoping poles. So there's that. Um, we also have our inflatable, which is what gives the tower its height. So this inflatable shrinks down into our movable box and will expand our tower upwards, giving it, it, giving it its height. Um, this inflatable is stored inside the structural base, um, which houses, like I said, our inflatable when undeployed, as well as our electronics and anchoring system. That being said, our anchoring system is used for stability, so these are grounding anchors that are screwed into the ground um, to provide stability and can be used for uh, micrometeorite impacts and stuff like that. And then lastly, we have our radio dish, which is used for data transmission. Lastly, we have our functional block diagram. So this kind of just shows our five main systems and how they're all integrated together um, to create a successful mission. As you can see, we have power and electrical, thermal control and survivability, payload, communications, structures and mechanisms, and we'll go over into these subsystems in a little bit more detail. Here we have a side-by-side -side comparison for the CAD models. So we have on the left the preliminary and revised CAD models, and on the right, the actual finalized design. A couple of things to know for the CAD models. We swapped over the antennas, so originally we had a dish antenna, we swapped over to a Yagi Uda antenna, which would be best suited for our purposes. Another thing to know is the grounding anchors, so we reduced the size just for ease of deployment and to best fit the size of our box. And another one to know is the accessibility. So we originally had half a panel to be able to access the entire structure, now we have a full panel on both sides that we can easily open up, access all the components, be able to repair everything. And that, that should be it for that. For the internal, we have just a minor difference. We have a aluminum box on the top that houses the inflatable. And underneath that, we have the pressure gauges and everything that correlates to the compressor as well. For manufacturing, we water jet cut all of our aluminum. From there, we ended up welding it all together and we drilled uh, holes for panels and for all of our internal components so that we could then install them inside. We then 3D printed most of our gearing components for our grounding anchors that involved PLA. And then we created the inflatable by cutting nylon and then cross stitching and then silicon sealing it together in order to get our inflatable structure. For the verification and controls, we found the maximum uh, before and after of the, the motors when measuring the drilling legs. What we need to find is the torque and the stress for each individual component. We used a tachometer and some other instruments to measure these results. And we made a peg leg of some kind using recycled wood from the lab. And then placed the, each individual drill leg inside the box where we would then um, tweak and adjust to our um, liking. So to test the structures and materials, 
for the, our components. We originally did a structure stability test, so this just determined the deformity under a nine kilogram vertical load on the actual box structure. So this test passed as no major visible deformations occurred. The second test was a grounding anchor test, so simply this would have the grounding anchors dig into the ground, preferably in a silty soil-like substance, similar to the moon's consistency. So the grounding anchors actually failed this test as they overextended and came out of the sliders and it did not hold the structure in place. So any resistance or any push would actually allow it to tip and additional components were actually damaged as a result of this test. In addition, two more uh, verification tests were performed for the structures and materials. The first one was a buckling test, and what we tried to see is that we want to know if our um, box structure would be, uh, would be able to withstand the force of our interior components. So a test specimen was cut into a rectangular piece and tested using a three-point bent, and this test showed that when subject to 150 newtons of force, which is the weight of the interior components, it showed little to no buckling and did not break. For the second test, uh, a pressure test was uh, used for our preliminary design uh, to see uh, how much uh, PSI our test inflatable could withstand. Uh, and so a rectangular prism of our first design was cut into a, and sewn using like the stitches. And this test showed that when subject to 40 PSI, uh, that it did not pop. Yeah, and so for power and electrical, I had to power four uh, four fans, four motors, and originally we were going to power a vacuum slash compressor. Uh, due to budget constraints, we could not go with that. It was way too expensive. So we did cut that, and we ended up going with a portable air compressor for your tire. Um, so that helped me out a lot there. But we had three LiPo batteries, and so with these batteries, I wanted to ensure that they were already in very good health. So to do this, I did an internal battery resistance test where I measured the voltage drop as I applied the load. Uh, I found a low IBR of around 8 to 10 milliohms, signifying that they were in great health. Um, next, I did a battery capacity test because with these towers, we want to be able to deploy them multiple times since they, the idea is that they can be picked up and moved anywhere around the moon all through the system. Um, so I calculated as we are running the motors into the ground so they were at load, I calculated that we could do 20 deploys uh, of our tower, which is more than enough for a mission duration. And then finally, just to make sure everything works safely and effectively, we uh, did a full systems test with the electricals and everything worked great. For survivability in the environment on the moon, there's two things to be concerned about. Uh, there's meteoroids uh, from the atmosphere because there's no, well, there's no atmosphere on the moon to protect it from meteoroids. And then thermal change because there's high and low uh, temperature changes on the moon. So for micrometeoroids, we did an ANZUS simulation that involved a two millimeter diameter silicate uh, micrometeoroid. And then we put that to do 1.5 kilometers a second uh, impact onto our plates. Uh, originally, we'd go from one plate, which is our just standard thickness of our aluminum plates, uh, to like maybe a third of a centimeter thickness. Uh, from there, the meteoroid bur bursts through. So then we increased the plate count to figure out how many it would take to protect the internal components. And we found that just five plates, which is roughly like 1.3 centimeters, was enough to destroy any micrometeoroid upon impact. Uh, for our thermal change, we basically covered the box and sealed it using tape on all the major holes during manufacturing. And then we attached the fans and all of the internal electrical and mechanical components and ran them. From there, we ran it for 10 minutes to see what the thermal change was inside. Uh, from there, our average uh, temperature inside the box was 76 degrees Fahrenheit with a decrease over time, which is good for the internal components just in a nominal temperature because the electronics need to be anywhere from negative 40 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit to survive. but that's most likely due to the fact that our temperatures were relatively close together. For the leak test, we used water to test for any leaks at the valves and also the seams. Uh, we used the prototype and had it inflated for around eight hours. There was no real loss in volume, but there was a minimal loss of pressure. This did prove that if we did this at a larger scale, which we then did for our inflatable, uh, we'd be able to use the same methods of the zigzag stitch and seal it. We also identified that the main source of leaks were the corners. So in order to mitigate that, we just got rid of the corners and made it a cylinder. 
For our final inflatable test, you can see here inflating on the side. Uh, that's just a nominal case without any additional weight other than the um, a 10 mock-up. Our total height is 58 inches. Our total weight of all the box and everything is 53 pounds. This fits within the CubeSat uh, size of 150 U's. The inflation time without any weights was 18 minutes, but the total amount of weight we could lift is 15 uh, pounds. Uh, increasing that amount of weight uh, also increases the amount of time, so that was almost like triple the amount of time to do 15 pounds, but that's just with doing the 50 PSI pump in, whereas we have the option to go as high as 150 based off of our pump. Our total air pressure within the inflatable is 1.5 PSI, which is comparable to a balloon, and our inflatable volume is roughly three feet cubed. So I'd like to thank the MAE department again. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Dr. Ware, and thank you, Dr. Ware, uh, for this opportunity to do this over the last year. Um, I'd like to say, make sure to come see our wonderfully pink box in the poster uh, and our electrically pink inflatable. Thank you. Emma. Next. Next team. It works. We are the Space Hamsters, and our project is the High Amplitude Moon Surface Telecommunication Inflatable Repeater, also called the Hamster. Um, I'm Catherine Soderman, and I'm the project manager. I'm Jason Solomon, and I'm the communications system lead. I'm Nate Vandermark, I'm the structures and technical co lead. And I'm Sam Mass, and I'm the power and electrical lead. So our project overview was to engineer an inflatable technology to be used on the Artemis mission for astronauts to use on the moon while maximizing the volume and weight ratio. So our design solution was to create an inflatable communications tower. So ours, as well as the team before us, it, def it inflates from a compact base box, but ours contains a semi-rigid slot truss structure so that once it, the tower is fully inflated, it does not need to um, be continued to be inflated and pressurized. It will just stand freely because of this slot truss structure. So our full-scale design will have sequential nitrogen inflation, whereas the small-scale one is just inflated manually from an air tank. Um, our, all of the electrical components and communications equipment will be solar powered with solar panels on the base box. And our full scale model will have receiving, extended, and um, repeater antennas based on the fact that Nokia and NASA right now are working to build um, 4G LTE on the moon. So our concept of operations is the tower will be um, loaded and launched aboard the Artemis and then it will travel to the moon where it will then land along with all of the other um, stuff for the Artemis missions. And then the deployment will be easy where the astronauts just oversee the inflation process. Um, and then for distribution, they can put the towers wherever they need to and angle the antennas so that they can um, efficiently boost the communication signal. So this is the functional block diagram. Here you can see our five main subsystems, which are the power and electrical the structures and mechanisms, the communications, inflation, and thermal radiation, and survivability, and you can see each of their respective components. So this is an overview of our small-scale prototype. 
Um, so number one is the triangular ring slot truss structure. This is the main structure of our tower and it sits within the inflatable bladder. So number two is the tensioner, tensioner spools. We weren't able to fully integrate them into our prototype, but the tensioner spools have the purpose of applying tension on, on each of the four sides of the tower. That way it inflates upright and doesn't tip or anything. Um, number three shows our base box, which houses all of the inflation and electrical equipment. Um, and then not shown is the infl inflatable bladder and the Kevlar protective layer and the air tank, which will all be mentioned soon. Um, our small scale prototype, the original design was supposed to be about five feet tall with three sections um, and a base box. We did not have time to get all three sections done due to 3D printing manufacturing errors. Um, so we, our actual prototype is only one section, um, but it should stand about, what is it? Two and a half feet tall now. Our structures and mechanisms, uh, our main goal with it was to minimize weight and maximize volume. So we wanted to deploy on inflation alone, so no electronics, motors, anything like that. So we had our triangular slot rails, which were hinged at one end. And as the air went in, they would sort of pop up and lock into place at the top in little holes that are at the tops of each of the slot structures. And the poles themselves are rounded to glide along the uh, slots and once fully deployed, they would lock into place and we wouldn't have to worry about inflating from there. And so here you can see a little clip of what it would look like as it deploys. And so the pull slide along the rails uh, and we, to minimize any sort of like torsion or bending of the poles, we added uh, little Lego hands is what we called them. Uh, you can see it down in the bottom there. And so the truss structure is the only thing that would be supporting the tower post inflation. And finally, for our base box, we had it uh, set up. So the full scale would be made out of aluminum 6061. For the small scale, due to budget and sort of requirements, we went with uh, uh, acrylic uh, material. And the dimensions are there. And we used four tensioner spools to stabilize the tower. Uh, due to it being on the moon, we didn't necessarily feel the need for it to be stabilized into the ground, just stabilized once it's on the ground. And so the four tensional, tensioner spools attach to the corners and stabilize it as the air goes in, just because air inflation is a little under, unpredictable. To best adapt the tower to the structural system, we implemented a very sectional inflation method. This would involve each individual section of the tower being inflated on its own before moving into the next one. To best do this, we implemented a sphincter method, which had multiple thin layers of film in between the designated sections within the truss structure, allowing air to flow freely between them, but still restricted enough so as to encourage one section to fill before the next one. Um, as you can see here, we made our entire bladder out of vinyl for the small scale, and then for the full scale, we'll be making it out of silicone, and then the sphincters will be made of the same material. So for the power and electrical subsystem, for the full scale, um, the it would use solar space grade solar sails, and it would use an industrial lithium ion battery, as well as a microcontroller. But due to budget and size constraints for the prototype, we sized down a little bit to where it's using three 7.5 watt monocrystalline solar panels. And these are mounted on the exterior of the base box, and they are generating solar power used to recharge the batteries. And these batteries are two lithium ion battery packs, uh, 12 volt, 5.2 amp hours, and these are mounted on the inside of the base box, and they're configured to the communication subsystem via a um, power inverter, which you can see at the bottom of the screen there. So for the communication subsystem, the full-scale model was mainly a three-component system with a highly directional parabolic antenna for communications with Nokia's planned base stations. We were actually in communication with them to try to design this communication system to work with their subsystem, um, but then they found out we were called the Space Hamsters and stopped responding. Um, we also have a 120 degree sector horizontal antenna, and this would be for communications with mobile devices on the network, and then a bi-directional amplifier, which would essentially boost the signal in both, both directions. For the prototype, because the main focus was the inflatable and structural subsystems, we simplified the communication system a little bit and just use a repeater 
uh, for 2.4 and 5 gigahertz networks, and then also a still a rotated mount um, that was 3D printed and secured onto the Kevlar uh, outer protective layer. Um, so this is our chosen material layering for the inflatable portion of the tower. So we had a silicone bladder that we mentioned before for air retention, and then Kevlar for strength and debris impact. And then Nextel, which is a ceramic fiber, and Kapton, which is a polyamide film for heat and radiation protection. And then vapor deposited aluminum as a coating for solar reflectance, which basically helps to regulate pressure changes. Um, but for the prototype, due to budget constraints, we just used vinyl instead of silicone, and then we still kept the Kevlar on. So for the prototype FEA, we utilized a static. Was that? Okay. Uh, we utilized a static structural uh, analysis. We estimated the communications load to be about six and a half kilogram mass at the top, and our maximum deformation was read as 7.5 millimeters. That may seem like a lot, but ANSYS actually reads deformation cumulatively, so that's the cumulative deformation of each each individual section below the top. So here are some zoomed in uh, images from both our deformation and our stress test. As you can see, the maximum for both occurs at the center of the top tri slot. Uh, due to build plate restrictions in 3D printing, this piece was actually separated, so this caused us some issues we eventually solved. Uh, another important thing to mention is FEA did not account for torsion occurring in the holes, so this was later accounted for by utilizing the tightness of the vinyl bladder, uh, increasing the pole diameter to 0.5 inches, as well as the previously mentioned Lego hand piece. To validate the inflation system, we utilized ANSYS Fluent so as to see if the sectional inflation method was actually viable. As you can see here, we have a 2D axisymmetric solution um, simulation with the inlet moved all the way to the top so as to move air down the entire structure. We have a high, high pressure point located at the middle point of the tower, which is to be expected, as well as the sphincters continually providing turbulence and encouraging sectional flow. As you can see, we have vortices within each of the sections. By doing this, we're going to have a very high pressure right in between where each of the sections are located. And by doing this, the air is going to have a very difficult time moving between each, but it won't be impossible. So over time, as the pressure increases, it should move freely. But and upon initializing, it should take a minute. So to validate the power electrical subsystem, we ran a test on both the battery and the solar panel. And the main goal here was just to make sure the battery can supply continuous voltage and the solar panel will provide continuous power output. And over a 30-minute period, both of those tests were successful. So for the communication system, uh, we simulated the transmission equation to estimate the power received at a distance on the lunar surface. And we needed about negative 110 decibels at, uh, to receive a strong signal. And we got this up to 1.4 kilometers. We also did the vertical antenna isolation equation to determine how um, far the antennas need to be from each other. And then conducted a moment balance just to make sure that everything was centered at the antenna or tower center. Um, so these are two of the tests that we did for the material layering. So the left one shows a reflectance simulation for vapor deposited aluminum. Um, basically, the results showed that at solar noon and at sunset and everywhere in between, the reflectance is greater than 50%, um, which was successful. And then the right one is a vinyl inflation test. We basically scaled down the top section of the prototype and then checked for um, ruptures and tears after inflating it, and there weren't any. So. Um, so for manufacturing, as previously stated, we 3D printed most of our pieces and then used earth grade materials instead of space grade materials for the prototype. <clears throat> this is our mass and volume budget. Um, it had a very low mass at only about 15 kilograms. Um, we did this by keeping everything lightweight and 3D printing our parts instead of using aluminum. Um, this GIF and pictures show what it looks like when it's inflating and also when it is fully inflated. So as you can see, it's kind of tipping a little bit in the video. This is because we were not able to incorporate the tensioner spools. But once we did tie some string to them and pull in the corners to add some tensioning, um, it was able to inflate without tipping as much. And the picture on the left shows what it looks like fully inflated, where the truss structure is supplying um, all of the structure needed to keep it standing. Um, so our project, we showed a successful proof of concept of our inflation method. We did have to revisit our structural stability of the poles and the truss structure. Um, future tests um, would involve a second and third section because we did get them 3D printed. We just didn't get them on our model in time for this. Um, and we did achieve a high volume mass ratio. Um, thank you to Dr. Wary and Dr. Ware and our TA Matthew.
Are you over time? Are you good on time? No, we're good. Uh, oh, you're quiet on down. Down. Oh, I said project. Oh, project. I think you said quiet now. Oh, my bad. Could you hear me? I can. Okay, cool. Oh, what's up? Space Park Balloon Alex. Where are you? Oh, yeah. I can't see you. Keep for yourself. So, um, so I think I, want, I, I think I want to meet you with Isabella. Please project, please project. Okay. I know she has a good eye, so. Yeah. <laughs> project, project. Okay, Use the mic. we can do that. We can definitely do People that. People are online. Yeah. Okay. We have two minutes to go. How we? How we? Wait, what? We have two minutes left. We have two minutes to go. How does it? I'll just two minutes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we've got two minutes left. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Where's the where's the presenting table? Oh. Guys, can we move over a little bit? Yeah. Which one do I which one do I have again? Oh. That's the first one I have. Um, I don't down. know. Where where is it? Functional block. Okay, there you go. Alrighty. How do I present again? Which way is it? Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I am very proud to introduce my team, Space Pack Balloonatics, who are presenting Arise Astronaut Recovery Inflatable Support Equipment. Here is a brief overview of our presentation outline. Um, first, we will start by introducing ourselves, move on to the project overview, then design solution, followed by manufacturing, and then finally the validation, verification, and testing methods. My name is Louis Louis. I am the test and safety lead. My name is Devin Johnson. I am the manufacturing lead. My name is Brooke Schubarg. I'm the manufacturing and communications lead. I'm Maliki Kerrigan, and I'm the financial lead. I'm Thomas Stolson, and I'm the system engineer. I'm Trevor Henderson, and I'm the communications liaison. And I'm Isabella Sior, and I'm the project manager. So, the problem? As NASA plans to return to the moon, past experience will shape future mission success. During extravehicular activities conducted on the Apollo missions, 48 of the following events took place across 80 hours, um, averaging to 0.8 hours 0.8 falls per hour. Due to spacesuit limitations, uh, astronauts can take up to two minutes to return upright. With longer EVAs and greater distances to cover, falling is likely to increase, risking the integrity of missions. Our senior design project was inspired by NASA's Big Idea Challenge to develop inflatable equipment for lunar operations. Our project helps avoid damage caused by lunar dust, save time for EVAs, and prevent overexhaustion of astronauts by returning them to their feet quicker. To ensure seamless integration with an EVA suit, our solution had to be compact and reusable to make use of the limited space available on EVA suits. To solve this problem we identified, we came up with our astronaut recovery inflatable support equipment, or ARISE. ARISE functions by rapidly inflating a bag on the astronaut's chest. This bag is then deflated afterwards to be reused. This allows a rise to return an astronaut to their feet quickly after a fall event and enhances the safety and efficiency of EVAs. And additionally, um, a rise can be controlled both manually and um, wirelessly for redundancy. So for Arise's concept of operations, it will arrive to the moon via NASA's CLPS, which is Commercial Landing um, Payload Services. And then from that, it will be equipped to the astronaut on these EVA missions. And then during those EVA missions, it is likely that the astronaut will face a falling event. And that's when the Arise mission will take place, in which the astronaut will inflate the Arise, uplifting them to their free feet, and then deflating it, in the fold, and it will fold back into their chest plate, allowing for reuse. Now our team will review the design solution for each of the systems. 
So for the theory, the system works and operates by using the pressure differential between the bag and the storage tank in order to drive this pressurized gas into the bag to uh, expand it. The, when the astronaut is on the ground, the bag is compressed against the astronaut and the ground, and as the, pressure, as the flow goes from the tank into the bag, it starts to build up pressure and force the astronaut upwards. And as the astronaut lifts off from the ground, more room is given for the bag to expand, and that pressure will then drop to exert less force on the astronaut. That way it is a controlled uh, maneuver to bring them up into their feet. And in order to explore the feasibility of this design solution, we, you, we created a MATLAB dynamic and thermodynamic model in order to capture the dynamics of the inflating bag and how that translates into the motion of the astronaut. And moving on to our functional block diagram. So there's a lot going on right here, but basically this kind of outlines the power and information travel through each individual subsystem. And the brain of it's the Raspberry Pi, and it collects data from the sensors, and then it also controls the inflation and deflation of a rise, and it also sends data to the ground station. So on the right is a CAD render of the Arise design. As you can see, it's designed to be wearable by the astronaut using a harness that connects the front and the back housing containers. And it is equipped similar to how you would equip like a backpack with the shoulder straps going over the shoulders and side straps. The front housing pack contains the inflatable bag and the back housing pack contains all of the electronics and the plumbing. And Arise can be used to recover the astronaut from approximately nine falls during an EVA for a single charge. Uh, it operates at 100 PSI and it's a closed loop system, meaning it runs on one initial air supply. The designs, our front housing was designed to be small enough to sit comfortably on an astronaut's chest. This housing seals and secures the outer bag and bladder onto what we call the middle plate. Um, the middle plate itself is tightened onto a silicone seal, which forms a sealed chamber behind the bag itself, in which the plumbing system directly feeds into the front housing. The bladder is designed to maintain a seal and endure any forces it might experience during, a, um, during operation. The back housing of the Arise system houses all the critical components used to power the system and to provide the gas needed for the inflation. The, it contains the plumbing subsystem that is used to inflate and deflate the bag in a closed loop system. The inflation system con uh, consists of an electrical proportional solenoid valve that is used to allow gas to permit towards the tank once activated. In the deflation system, it contains a pump that is used, an electric pump that is used to drive the air from the bag back into the tank for future use. The system also has an active cooling system that is used to maintain the temperature of each of the components during their operation at an ideal temperature. And the pressure relief valve is used to protect the system against overpressurization as a redundancy. And then for the power and electrical uh, electronics of Arise, um, we kind of split it up into the communications controls and ground station because these three all stem from the Raspberry Pi. And with the Raspberry Pi, it comes with the sensors and the ground station is a laptop. And so communicating between the Raspberry Pi and the laptop, we use Wi-Fi signals. And for the power, we're using two 14.8 volt, 5200 milliamp hour batteries, and we connect them in series to double the voltage. And then to activate inflation, deflation, and as well as the thermal control, they're all connected via a three channel relay board. And the five volt fans, they get activated if, at, if they reach the predetermined temperature. And now we move on to the Arise manufacturing. So we started about a month late due to preparation for the NASA Big Idea Challenge proposal. The timeline started with assembling individual subsystems and then we integrated those into the front or back housing compartments and then we tested and adjusted to reach our final prototype. So for the, we have the two housing packs, the front and back housing pack. For each of those, the front housing pack, we water jetted clamps that connect the inflatable bag to the front pack. And then we machined and welded the side walls for that and then sealed that with silicone sealing. For the back housing pack, we machined and cut out holes for components and welded walls and to, to the back plate. And all together, after everything was welded, we welded brackets to secure the packs onto the harness 
and secure components in the housing bag. And all of this was cut from 3 16 inch aluminum alloy 6061. The inflatable bag manufacturing consists of two different materials. Um, the first is uh, the inner bladder, which consists of a polyethylene material, two sides of that. Um, and there are, it is constructed in the shape of a rectangular prism. Um, this is heat sealed at the two seams with um, just an iron and then sewn and then sealed again with uh, flex seal to allow for a more durable um, part at the seams. And then the uh, protective outer bag is the second component, which is constructed of ripstop nylon, which is lightweight and durable. Um, and then it um, it was formed in the shape of a trapezoidal prism, and this material has two, uh, five pieces with seams of double seams, and each of the double seams allows for the tethers to go through the seams um, and connect in the corners of the bag at the tether loops. The plumbing system was then assembled, and we did this by attaching thread tape to each of the NPT fittings and then we would use a vise to hold each of the components and then use a wrench to tighten them down and to help align each of the parts. And then we would use push connect fittings to help interface both the tube to the actual NPT fittings itself. Um, during the assembly, we did leakage uh, checks to ensure that the system was leakage free as we added each part. And we did this by applying soap and water at each of the connection points, tapping the system off, pressurizing it, and checking for bubbles during, it, during that pressurization. And at that point, we would continue to tighten each of the components until there were no more bubbles seen at each of the interiors between the parts. <clears throat> and then for electronics manufacturing, it kind of went, it went very well and how we had designed originally, we didn't have to replace any parts in the whole design solution, but the only things we had to replace is that if we accidentally like blew up a buck converter and actually last week we blew up the Raspberry Pi at one in the morning. So that was a lot of fun, but we got it replaced and it's all working. So we connected it all to the relay channels. Um, the sensors are all online and the thermal control, we programmed it to turn on the fans at 30 degrees Celsius and to turn off at 20 degrees Celsius. So you can see that picture there. It's got all the wires just kind of like spewing around and that was a lot of cable management, but it all kind of turned out pretty well. So for the final prototype, um, this is our test rig named after Charles, astronaut Charles Duke and he had 13 falls in 20 hours. So he is a fabulous um, candidate for testing Arise. Um, so the picture on the left shows the back housing of Arise, which has a clear acrylic uh, plate, um, so you can see all of the inner components. The middle image shows the inflated bag, and then the far right image shows the deflated bag nicely folded back into the uh, front housing container. Um, and you can also see the tethers, I mean the, um, sorry, excuse me, the harnesses on, located on the front of the shoulders and on the sides. Oh, for the vv and T's for Arise, we'll get into the electronics. So we had a redundancy test and a ground station test. And so the redundancy test, it just made sure that all the electronics were online and that nothing was disconnected. And then for the ground station test, we were able to live plot any data that we wanted that the sensors were collecting, and it would send that to the laptop, and we could see that real time. So for the systems EV and T test, we had a cycle test and a hydrostatic test. The cycle test was to ensure that the battery was capable of powering the Arise for multiple iterations of inflation and deflation, which we proved successful as it consumed like about 0.4 volts per use for inflation and deflation. And then for the hydrostatic test, we pressurized the plumbing system to 1.25 times operation pressure, and this was, was a success as the plumbing system was able to hold this pressure and was free from leaks. And then we conducted inflation and deflation dv &T, where we did a leak identification test with the bag, ensuring that there were no leaks in our design solution, and we, this was successful as the bag did not leak and was able to be pressurized. We also did mission testing, where we tested our fully integrated Arise prototype running it through inflation and deflation cycles. And this was successful as well. And here on the right, you can see our systems test where we have our astronaut Charles Duke in a standing and fallen orientation. We saw successful inflation and deflation cycles for each test. But one thing to note is Arise is designed to be used on moon gravity, 
and as such will not be fully successful on Earth gravity. To conclude, we have created ARISE, which is a modular inflatable system that will help recover a fallen astronaut. Future prototypes would need higher pressures for full unassisted recovery on Earth, and if we had an increased budget, this would allow for full integration into modern day spacesuits. <coughs> and then we would just like to thank the MAE department for all their help with this project, and we'd also like to thank all of you for listening. <laughs>
So um, for practical use, the fist will all be just on one hand, but for our prototype use, it'll be on two hands. On one hand, you'll have the sleeve, which will be the, uh, the user's input, and then the actual output will be placed on the table as your soft robotic extension. So the microcontroller on that sleeve hand will then read the input from the fingers. So say you move your fingers in a closed uh, fist. That data will then be fed into the soft robotic extension, which also has its own microcontroller. That data is then read to different pumps, one for vacuuming air and one for pushing air. And then based on what movement you did on this hand, it would take that data and then push the air into the soft robotic extension. So for example, you close your fist, the data will be read into the soft robotic extension, the vacuum or the, uh, the pump would push air and then it would cause the fingers to close. Vice versa if you're taking air out. So open, your air, open your hand, the air would be vacuumed out and the fingers would open. Uh, all these um, systems are powered by batteries, so we'll talk about that first. To power fist, we decided to acquire eight lithium polymer batteries. Mm -hmm. Lithium polymer batteries have a compact energy dense design that is in line with our goal to build a low size and weight inflatable technology. Each battery provides 3.7 volts and has a 10,000 milliamp hour capacity. The, these specifications were uh, selected based on the maximum power draw of every other subsystem over a maximum EVA period, which is about eight hours. And as you can see, the batteries will be housed in the base of the fist where they connect to everything else. Since we do not have a space suit to protect the prototype wear, the fist is currently sitting on the space where the pumps and the batteries are located. On the final design, those would ideally be located in the back of the astronaut, sending in the data through the arm. As you guys can see, the structure of this was a skeleton of it. It's 3D printed using PLA. Um, we chose to 3D printed not only because of the cost, but also because of the weight. Um, since this is an extension, we wouldn't want it to weigh down the arm of the astronaut because that would take away the purpose of this. As you guys can see on the top of the palm, we have slots for the fingers. Now, for the inflatable fingers, um, the actual inflatable part of the whole design, the challenge with the fingers is to create a structure that is both rigid in the neutral position and in the closed inflated position. So what we came up with is we used a thermoplastic polyurethane fabric and we created cylinders to represent the finger bones and this accordion shape to represent the knuckles so that when it inflates, the only part that's really inflating is the accordion shape to create that 90 degree bend that you would with your fingers. And this is a representation of one knuckle on the right. And this is what a full finger would look like. Now, unfortunately, due to time constraints and the materials we have, um, we resulted in a couple holes in the finger models. So uh, for our prototype, we do have a basic air chamber to show the inflation and deflation of each finger. Um, but unfortunately, the seams that need to be used to connect everything are very small and we used a very big heat gun. So once we have the fingers working, the microcontroller is what controls it. Um, we have two Arduino boards. The Arduino Due is located on the wrist of the astronaut and it's feeding in the sensors from his hand to send in that data to the Arduino Uno located on the forearm of FIS and that is what activates the valves and the pumps so that FIS can actually mimic that data. And that data is gathered through the GNC system. So for guidance, navigation, and control, we start off with the EMG, the electromyography sensor, as you can see on the right. It reads the electric potentials in the forearm by the muscle contractions. It also is equipped with an IMU. Speaking of IMUs, there are four more fastened to the back of the hand, where the fingernails would be. And these are measuring the displacements of each finger. This data is compared to the IMU in the forearm because although we are measuring the change in displacements, the displacement changes from here and here between those two positions, even though the fingers themselves haven't moved. So we compare the IMU data on the back of the hand to the IMU and the EMG. There's a similar setup for navigation, similar setup to the IMUs I mean. And what this is doing is it's reading where did FIS actually move? Where FIS moved is being compared to how the astronaut wanted to move it, and the control system is then deciding whether to activate the pumps to push more air in, or draw more air out. Speaking of pumps, we have pneumatics. 
So the actual pressure to move the soft robotic hand is provided by two micro diaphragm pumps. One pushes air in, one pulls air out. On our prototype, these are taking from and exhausting directly back into the atmosphere. Of course, that wouldn't work in space because there is no atmosphere. So a full model would use a pressurized uh, pressure chamber. The air is taken from there and sent to the fingers. When it's pulled back out, it is then repressurized back in the chamber by a pump. We didn't do this for the prototype, primarily for time and budget reasons, since it isn't needed here on Earth for the prototype. That's mostly a proof of concept. We decided it was better to put that money towards other components. So the pressure from the pumps is routed through these solenoids. There's 10 in total, two for each finger. One controls air in, one out. That's so that if you have one finger or fingers moving in one direction, you can have others moving in the opposite direction simultaneously, so each finger is completely independent in its motion. Uh, the solenoids are controlled by the GNC. When they need to move the fingers, the pumps kick on. The appropriate solenoids open, allowing the air to move into the fingers, so they curl. Once they're in the correct position, the solenoids cut back off and the movement ceases. Uh, so as FIST is being used in moving, we do want to protect it from any damage that may occur in use. So we have a survivability subsystem consisting of a Kevlar and Mylar fabric covering, which provides thermal protection as well as mechanical resistance and we um, also designed it to resist um, penetration by lunar regolith that it may uh, come into contact with during use. So you can see on the right uh, that we conducted a test to assure that dust cannot penetrate the covering. And then we also came up with a design for a thermal management system to ensure that all the electronic components of FIST would uh, remain within their oper operating temperature range. Here's where we're at with our prototype. This is our system test where you guys can see all the subsystems of FIST interacting with each other. Here we have an astronaut's hand, mine, <laughs> with the glove on. And you guys can see as my hand moves, the Arduino reads, reads in the data from the sensors, send it, sends it back to the Arduino on FIST, and activates the pumps and the valves so that FIST can mimic the movement correctly. So our product is a soft robotic hand extension that increases dexterity, endurance, safety, and comfort. So the technology beneath this is a remotely controlled soft robotic hand. So in addition to this application, we think there's more with maybe the astronauts using FISC inside of the habitat and controlling FISC outside of the habitat to do other applications, maybe on a rail system or on a rover. That's all the time we have for today. <laughs> Check us out at the symposium, and thank you very much. But I think this one is working. Yes, I could kind of hear them. They just should be a bit closer. They shouldn't yeah. be dead. They've been kept on the truck. Just dead. Wow. Wildfire. Are you not sitting? Are you not sitting down, I guess? Um, I'll be fine today. I'm very you stand, today. you just. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> please, I'm um, trying to project. Ah, yeah, let's okay. try. Uh, yeah, and and th right. this, this works. Lord knows this works. <laughs> for. I don't know. Okay. If you guys can be close to this thing, just, just project to it. <laughs> right. And they can still, they can still hear them. It's just, it's just a lot quieter than. Because I could hear the guy standing here just fine. Yeah, yeah. um, it's just everybody else. Okay. Um, please try to. Just be I think this you know. working. So uh, when we have two minutes to go, I will just need to. Okay. So you don't need to in. Just two minutes to go. Yeah. Who is this? Wait, is that for you?
Not no, mine. that's someone else's. These are mine. Go <laughs> down. You got stress. I trust you. <laughs> We are Wolfpack Inflatable Lunar Design. Okay. <laughs> you said we have like two minutes for it, so. Great. <laughs> We are Wolfpack Inflatable Lunar Design, and this is our remote operated vehicle for regolith retrieval. First, we will introduce ourselves and then the purpose of our project. Then we will go over our design solution and how we manufactured and tested our prototype. My name is Brayden Koffel. I'm a systems engineer at Toby. I'm Eric St. Clair. I'm the manufacturing lead. I'm Bridget Shea. I'm the communications liaison. I'm Jack Lance. I'm the safety testing instructors lead. I'm Edward Hurley, and I'm the project manager. I'm Leo Morris. I'm the finance and CAD lead. I'm Coda Lemelin. I'm the other systems engineering code lead. All right, so this project comes from NASA's 2024 Big Idea Challenge, which is to develop novel uses of inflatable technologies for lunar operations. And the context of this design challenge comes from NASA's ongoing Artemis missions, which aim to establish a more sustainable presence on the moon. In support of this goal, our project, the Wild Rover, will utilize inflatable soft robotic technology to transport lunar regolith across the lunar surface for in situ resource utilization purposes, or ISRU. So here's the concept of operations for our rover. Of the three main phases. First, we have the space transport phase, which includes getting the rover from Earth to the moon using something like the Artemis program. And you have phase two deployment. That's going to include an initial inflation of the rover and then a systems check prior to our mission. And then finally, the mission phase, which has been the focus of our project, has the functions of loading the rover with lunar regolith, transporting the regolith across the surface of the moon, and then recharging the rover for future missions. This is the functional block diagram of the Wild Rover. In this case, you can see power supplied by an onboard battery that is directed towards the Arduino, which is the main control unit of the project. The control unit Arduino receives input data from a controlling astronaut, and it will direct the relay modules to uh, actuate power to the pumps and valves, which for this rover was brought in air from the atmosphere, and in a real test it would be on the pressure chamber. This air is directed by pumps and valves into the inflatable wheel bladders and this inflatable chassis section. This slide shows a picture of our CAD simulation compared to our finalized rover prototype. The main difference between the two is that on the prototype there's a layer of mylar around the chassis that helps reflect heat and there are also some wooden support valves to help maintain, maintain the chassis rigidness after inflation. For this project, we developed two novel implementations of existing inflatable technologies. First, we used soft robotics to create a propulsion system entirely without pinch points. Pinch points can pro prove fatal in the vacuum of space as they can puncture spacesuits and injure astronauts. Additionally, our drop stitch technology in the chassis maximizes the stiffness to weight ratio and stow ratio. This technology has previously only been used in flat panels such as temporary shelters and a single experimental aircraft in the 50s. So this is our bill of materials. Some of the important components to note are the aluminum discs, which would sit between the chassis and the bladders, the electrical components, which would be mounted onto one of the aluminum discs, the payload bag pictured in red, which would be inside of the chassis, and the bladders for propulsion, which would be mounted to 3D printed supports. The chassis uses a drop stitching technique, which uses a mesh material in between the two imperiable materials, which will provide structure and also allows airflow in between the materials. The bladders were created by measuring, cutting, and sewing the material so they're all a uniform shape. A thin layer of sealant, seal, sealant was applied on the seams and around the washers to help um, eliminate leaks. This had to be done multiple times. We found that as the leaks were covered, the air started to actually go through the material though.
And then the final portions of manufacturing included installing the pumps and valves, as well as the electronics to control them onto a rover and then wiring them together. Uh, so you can see the main hub of electronics in the picture on the left. And then we use the Arduino IDE to program the Arduino that interface is shown in the center. And that consisted of compiling coding libraries and then writing custom uh, source code to control the rover either manually or automatically in tandem with an accelerometer. And then the Arduino also provides an access point that a user can connect to and access the graphical user interface shown on the right. Then to start testing our communication subsystem, we started by testing the pressure and temperature sensor. This was done by exposing the sensor to a range of pressures and temperatures which the rover would be expected to operate in. Um, this served the purpose of showing us whether or not the sensor could report accurate data within those ranges. And then it also showed us whether or not the sensor could transmit that data to the Arduino and then back to the user for purposes of monitoring the different temperatures and pressures of the components in the rover. So you can see the testing setups there on the left and the data collected during those tests on the right. This test was conducted to ensure that the rover is operational within a range of distances. So to do this, we connected to the Arduino's access point and performed multiple operations. To see this, you can see the red light on the uh, relay turning on and off. Every time the light engaged, the distance between the Arduino and the operator increased. When the test was finished, we had reached the end of the hallway and the communication was still good, which was about 73 meters, which was approximately three times our design requirement. To test the battery life of the rover, the pumps and valves were connected together, supplied power by the main battery, and then run in a way similar to how they actually would be in the actual rover. The design requirement for battery life is that the rover will be able to carry out missions one and a half hours in duration. And this test showed that our battery did meet this requirement. To simulate standard operating conditions, the payload subsystem was rolled down the hallway. We found that the payload loss rate was 4.3% per kilometer traveled, which is within our allowable maximum of 5%. In order to simulate anomalous operating conditions, such as a vertical tumble, the subsystem was statically upended and managed to hold back seven kilograms of payload. This test was part of the propulsion subsystem and the purpose was to determine how much a bladder will deflate under a weighted load. For this, a test bladder was inflated using a pump and weight was placed on top of a piece of cardboard that sat on the bladder. After each um, varying load, the circumference was measured and the maximum deflation was found to be about 35% less than the fully inflated bladder holding about 1,153 grams. So for the main crux of the propulsion system, a speed test was calculated to find how fast the bladders could be inflated and deflated on the chassis. We started off with one pump, pump per bladder and that gave an average of about nine seconds of inflation time and nine seconds of a deflation time, which couldn't work for the driving requirements of the rover to hit a good nominal speed. So adhering to the 50% duty cycle of the pumps rated by the manufacturer, we bumped it up to three pumps and that gave us an inflation time all of down to five seconds and a deflation time of about seven seconds, which are both within the driving requirements and let the rover hit its maximum top speed. So each bladder was sealed multiple times to ensure optimal efficiency. And then we tested them by submerging them in water and we used a video tracker to track the bubbles that leaked out. And then we used that data to calculate how much volume we're losing during inflation. And additionally, we did an endurance test by inflating a bladder and leaving it idle. And as you can see from that graph on the right, it's able to maintain 50% of its volume over a 15 hour period, which long surpasses our mission requirement. Once the rover was ready to go, we took it out and we tested it on sand to simulate the lunar environment. We tested multiple terrains that produced pressure and we made a ramp at a five degree incline to test it on a controlled uphill surface. And after our testing, we reached a final speed of 2.65 centimeters per second. So this is the budget breakdown. We were allotted $2,000 for this project. The main crux of the budget went to propulsion, which is almost $630. The smallest part was communications at maybe just around $53. And all taxes and shipping weren't, weren't accounted for at first, came up to about 5% of the budget at $101. And we're still left with nearly 11% of our budget left with $212 remaining. In conclusion, during manufacturing, we experienced some challenges, which are pressure loss from the seams and the material. We also had some uh, pump output that was too little for our chassis as we experienced some buckling, which means that we had to have some dowels that were installed. 
In the future, knowing this, we would change the material of our chassis and our bladders, but we would also get a new pump that had that could supply a larger output, because when we attached the chassis to the shop airline, the buckling seats to exist, and we could also remove the dowels. The key takeaway would be that um, our rover met its mission of being able to transport the lunar regulus simulant, and we can also take away that this design, despite its challenges, supports um, lunar exploration and development for the future. Thank you. The big guys. Taiko, 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 Taiko. Where is it? Which of them? No, you did. I don't know, but unfortunately, this is not still working. We'll just talk about it. Project. Okay. I know. You guys are good. Talk so loud. Know. Yeah. So um, we, we have two minutes to go. I will just say two minutes. They were crazy on time. They have two minutes to spare. What's all I'm saying? Okay. Sounds good. So can we all scoot down so they can read? Yeah. Yeah. Smith. Do we want to like so, so switch far, the way I, I that enjoyed we're standing? Matthew. Matthew was in charge. Do we want to switch <laughs> the way that we're standing so they have? They should, we should be fine. Okay. Fine. All right. Hi everyone, we are Tatko Lykos with the High Powered Rocketry Club and this is our project overview for the NASA Student Launch Competition of 2024. So to get started, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Hannah McDaniel, the team lead. I'm Cameron Brown, the structures lead. I'm Matthew Simpson, the aerodynamics lead. I'm Brain Ruda, the recovery lead. I'm Frank Christ, the payload electronics lead. I'm Joseph Watson, the payload structures lead. I'm Michael Wax, the payload systems lead. I'm Cheyenne Large, the integration lead. So the NASA Student Launch Challenge involves um, an eight month long competition to design, build, and fly two high power rockets, a subscale and a full scale vehicle. The full scale vehicle has to reach an altitude between 4,000 and 6,000 feet, which we predict and determine back in October. And there's also a payload component of the challenge, which varies from year to year. This year we were required to build a Stimnot atmosphere independent lander and this lander had to house four stem knots and be able to be <laughs> deployed from the launch vehicle mid-flight and safely land without the use of parachutes or streamers. This, this competition it requires technical reports critiqued by NASA engineers and we compete uh, this Saturday in Huntsville, Alabama. So wishes luck on that guys. <laughs> so let's get into our launch vehicle design. All right, so for the launch vehicle overview, uh, here you can see a CAD diagram of the launch vehicle, and you can also see our subscale and our full scale. Uh, the uh, as-built length is about just short of nine feet, and then the maximum diameter is about half a foot. Uh, the airframe and coupler sections are all made of G12 fiberglass, while the fins are made from G10 fiberglass. The uh, bulkheads and internal structure was all made from aircraft-grade birch plywood. Uh, this gives us a launch weight of about 50.6 when it's 50.6 pounds when it's fully loaded, and that's going to uh, accelerate with a single-stage solid rocket motor at the back, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and then the launch vehicle separates into th uh, three sections via uh, one non-separation point and two separation points. All right, some of the design benefits uh, include basically accessibility and also reusability through the removable fin system and the removable nose cone bulkhead. These are both components that are normally permanently epoxied into the airframe, so the fins and the motor retention system are normally you know, permanently in the airframe and you can't really assess for any damage, you can't add ballast, and if a fin breaks, you have to replace the entire fin cam, which is no good. Uh, so we changed that and added, uh, made it removable. And uh, for the removable nose cone bulkhead, we did basically the same thing. Uh, we can access the entire space inside the nose cone for ballast and recovery electronics. And now onto our recovery system design. Starting with the recovery concept of operations, once the launch vehicle reaches apogee, it will separate, allowing the drug parachute to deploy to the launch vehicle. Uh, the launch vehicle will then descend under drug parachute to 800 feet, where it will separate again with an ejection charge, pushing the nose cone out as an independent piece. Uh, attached to the nose cone is the sail, 
and it also descends under its own parachute, and then once that separates, the main parachute will be allowed to deploy for the rest of the launch vehicle. Some of the components consist of two competition altimeters that are redundant, uh, two GPS transmitters and receivers, and uh, Kevlar shock core is used to keep all the separated sections of the launch field vehicle together during descent, and we use uh, triple F black powder ejection charges for separation. For the avionics sled, this was 3D printed with PETG. Uh, the back features mounting space for uh, the primary and secondary altimeter batteries, um, and then the top surface we mount the altimeters and trackers uh, with threaded heat inserts and standoffs. The primary altimeter is a Missile Works RSC-3, and the secondary altimeter and tracker is an Eggtime Requiza. Some of the design benefits of the recovery system is that it is dual deployment. Uh, this decreases descent time, uh, landing impact energy, and drift distance to meet uh, the NASA competition requirements. Uh, we have nose cone separation, which allows for payload and main parachute deployment. Uh, we use redundant altimeters in case uh, one of the primary altimeters fails, so we have a backup system, so that way we can uh, deploy all the parachutes. We use pull pin switches for mechanical arming of both altimeters, uh, 3D printed AV sled for eight feet of fabrication, and the GPS trackers do not interfere with other onboard electronics or other team's launching method. And now on to our mission performance predictions. Getting into some of the uh, simulations that we ran, the first thing that we needed to select was a motor. Given that our launch vehicle was one of the largest and heaviest launch vehicles that we've produced, we decided to pick the Aerotech L1940X, uh, which has one of the largest uh, thrust to weight ratios uh, for the casing that we have. Um, so given that uh, we selected this motor, the average thrust to weight ratio for our launch vehicle uh, was 8.64, and this accelerated our launch vehicle to a maximum velocity of 555 feet per second, or approximately Mach 0 0.5. Getting into the launch vehicle stability, the two things that we need to control are the center of pressure and center of gravity. Uh, we used three different tools to uh, measure this in order to make sure that our simulations were accurate. Uh, in order to control the center of pressure, we used uh, fins, and these fins were swept back in order to pull that center of pressure further back. And then for center of gravity, we included three ballast locations, one on the RFS, one on the forward avionics bulkhead, sort of in the middle of the launch vehicle, and one in the nose cones. We have three different places that we can place weights, and this allowed us to tune our uh, stability margin to be around 2.7 uh, for the launch vehicle. In order to damp the uh, oscillation when the launch vehicle leaves the rail, uh, we utilized a rocket pie simulation where we placed rail buttons uh, at two, two different locations, an upper and a lower, and then simulated what happens if we change those locations. From our plot, we can see that uh, X and Y axes are the rail button locations, and the z-axis is that maximum amplitude of that oscillation. Uh, from this, we can see that the ra one rail button placed around the CG and one rail button placed as far aft as possible uh, minimizes that oscillation. And then finally, summing all these together, we're able to generate a target apogee. In order to generate a drag profile for our launch vehicle, we uh, used an ANSYS fluent simulation, and then we plugged that into Rocket Pi, which then allowed us to generate the uh, figures you see here. One is Apogee, the one on the left is the Velocity and Acceleration, and the one in the middle is a Google Earth KML file where you can see the ascent and descent profile of the launch vehicle. And now on to our payload design. For the payload, we designed an autonomously controlled contra-rotating rotor blade system that would slow the sail down to a descent velocity of five miles per hour. The sail weighed 7.5 pounds, had a height of 23.8 inches, and had a rotor blade diameter of 34.3 inches. The rotor blades and the landing legs fold to allow the sail to fit within a 5.5 inch deployment bay. The stem lots are secured in the sail to the bottom of the electronics sled. The rotor blades were built in-house. They were built using vacuum-assisted resin transfer molding uh, on a 3D printed rotor blade, which was made out of uh, carbon fiber polycarbonate filament and then it was wrapped in two layers of unidirectional carbon fiber and then infused with epoxy. And then later it was trimmed and wet sanded for safety. For the sail retention in the rocket, uh, we have this section called the deployment bay. Uh, so this houses the sail during the launch and the descent of the launch vehicle. Um, and then in the deployment bay, we have an electronics <coughs> and latch housing for manual release. Um, and because of this and the sail fits inside of it easily, uh, this allows for simple integration into our launch vehicle. And for the sail uh, con ops, so in this diagram we have how it will be packed in the rocket, and then as well during descent, uh, we have uh, how the sail will be, and then in the last part we'll have the sail once it's deployed. 
So it'll be a manual release from about 400 feet. Um, right here, uh, those are our stem knots. Uh, right here we have the uh, release of the sail uh, after the manual release. Um, so the sail works the ground uh, with a closed loop control to the motor uh, with a target impact velocity of five miles per hour. Um, and then also altitude, acceleration, and pressure data will be recorded uh, to measure the survivability of our stem knots. Some of the design benefits of our payload include uh, the support of crewed space flight as well as finding ways to condense larger systems into a launch vehicle while still meeting mission performance requirements. And now on to our launch results. For our subscale flight, our payload was not yet built, so in place of that, we used an eight pound mass simulator. We also used 3.2 pounds of ballast distributed uh, throughout the rocket to help us read a target apogee of 1,444 feet. After a successful launch, our altimeter showed that we reached an apogee of about 1,439 feet. And then our vehicle demonstration flight, we finally got a date after having struggled with weather the entire semester, um, and we launched on March 31st, and we launched on that L1940X, and that sent our full-scale launch vehicle to an apogee of about 3,800 feet. We launched with payload, um, fully armed inside the launch vehicle, and all recovery events were nominal. We had drogue separation at main, we had main and nose cone deployment at about 800 feet, and that nose cone separation allowed the deployment bay to be hanging free so that we could drop payload, which gets us to our payload demonstration flight, which took place in the same launch as vehicle demonstration flight. We launched our payload in a modified configuration. We weren't getting the exact thrust values we wanted from our thrust tests yet, so we took off the propeller blades and dropped it just under parachute so we could still get data collection. And the payload was successfully deployed via signal from ground station and landed in that configuration. Broke a few legs, but our stem knots were safe and sound inside and none of them were moved from their seats, as you can see in the image there. And that's all we have. If you have questions, feel free to ask us during the poster session later today. <laughs> Good job. Good job. I look so it's all of you. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know your work, but <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. I know I know him. Yeah. He's a pro. <laughs> yeah. Is there Just a project. Okay. Yep. Oh there's already a we have two minutes to go, I will say two minutes. Sounds good. Okay. Is this? Is this slideshow? This one. <laughs> this guy, right? Here. Yeah, good. Okay. One second. <coughs> Does it work? Nice. And then, there's no laser pointer? <laughs> it's going to be kind of hard to do laser pointer. Or actually, if we can do it on the screen. This is the first. Oh, there's like a... This is like an actual laser pointer. Oh, we can do that. <laughs> no, this has like an actual laser pointer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can do it with the mouse. <coughs> All right. Hi, hello, everyone. We are Team High Alpha for the multi-rotor section. We're going to be taking you through our drone, Elsa. I am Jeffrey Whitenack, the project manager, as well as Aerodynamics team lead. Hi, guys. My name is Kevin. I am the systems engineer, and I headed the payload and avionics portion of the vehicle. I'm Jack Boyette, and I am the financial and structures lead. I'm Nate Barnett, I'm the test and safety lead as well as the propulsion lead. So we at Team High Alpha, we decided to do avalanches as our natural disaster. And our mission statement is that we're going to build a multi-rotor drone that can search for survivors and deliver first aid as well as notify first responders of the whereabouts and well-being of the survivors. All right, so for our concept of operations, the mission starts by transporting the launch vehicle to the disaster site. And at that site, we'll set up our ground station and launch the vehicle to desired altitude. Once you reach that altitude, it begins searching the avalanche for survivors. Upon finding that survivor, it will ping the GPS location of the survivor and alert rescue authorities so they can be left rescued later. During that time, we'll deliver a communications payload to speak to the target and assess their needs if possible. And then upon assessing their needs, we can then uh, launch additional payloads, including med kits, water, food, whatever the target may need during that time. Upon completing the mission, we will return to the ground station and we'll pack up the drone and then continue our mission elsewhere. <coughs> so, we'd like to introduce you guys to ELSA. 
ELSA stands for Emergency Life Saving Search Apparatus. And ELSA is designed to be a hexacopter or six rotor search and re rescue UAV. And some notable features that it contains are a payload deployment mechanism, which allows us to uh, successfully accomplish the third stage of the concept of operations. Um, there is a camera integrated onto the vehicle, which allows the uh, search and rescue team to identify potential targets, um, as well as there's capabilities for autonomy. Um, so over the next few slides, we're gonna walk you through kind of the design, manufacturing, and test process for the vehicle, and then we'll finally show you guys how it works. was uh, modified for a different design because uh, for uh, easier manufacture. So uh, in order uh, for the manufacture of the base, because we have base plates and wings, uh, for the manufacture of the base, uh, base plates, we used uh, two by two foot, uh, square foot uh, carbon fiber uh, base uh, plate, uh, which we water jetted to, uh, to convert it into a two hexagonal uh, carbon fiber plates. Next, we have the beams. Uh, this was uh, manufactured using a six foot uh, cylindrical carbon fiber tube, which was cut into six, uh, six beams using an electrical bouncer. Uh, next, we have the supporting structure of the airframe, which are the motor and the boom mounts. Uh, this was 3D printed, so the initial design was deemed too complicated for the manufacturer. So we had to redesign it uh, to a new, uh, new 3D printed parts, uh, which was used for the airframe. So this is our payload and landing gear solution. The landing gear is made of 3D printed joints and carbon fiber tubing. We also use pool noodles along the bottom for shock absorption and to protect the carbon fiber. For the payload, it is also 3D printed and it uses a servo motor that's connected to the flight controller and it can be actuated on the RC receiver. Uh, for testing, we tested the landing gear and is able to land on surfaces up to 20 degree slope. And the payload deployment is able to release a three pound payload reliably. Alright, for our propulsion system, it's composed of an A80 KD Sunny Skies motor with a little bit of 11 by 5.5 inch propeller. The assembled systems on the right, these design decisions were driven by A, our thrust to weight ratio that we wanted to get, a minimum of 2 to 1, as well as our endurance, and then of course our budget. Here's our static thrust test. So this is one of the most important BB&T tests we had. It just proves that we could generate the needed thrust to A, hover, and then B, travel with a certain amount of speed. On the right there is a... Um, a table of our thrust. Our hover condition is met about 45% throttle, and our maximum thrust is three and a half pounds. And then these uh, throttle percentages are not arbitrary. They're actually, we chose 12 and a half percent increments because of our flight controller. We used that to determine what increments we would use. <coughs> so this brings us to the avionics on board ELSA. And this is kind of the system that ties together the hardware with the motors and the electronics. Um, so let's see if the laser pointer works. Sweet. Okay. So one of the uh, main highlights of and kind of the core of the avionics system is this Navio 2 flight control computer right here in the center. Um, so that is a Raspberry Pi board with a hat on top of it. And that ha hat provides interfaces to the motor controllers that Nate mentioned earlier, as well as it has some integrated sensors in the form of a barometer. Uh, accelerometer, redundant IMUs, and so on and so forth that are fed into the flight control computer to help us maintain stability and controlled flight. Um, we also have our power distribution board here, which supplies the requ requisite power to each of the motors. And then we have this GPS module over here, which provides real-time GPS uh, location for the pilots to use in order to locate the drone and operate it with an additional input. Um, and then finally, the two major highlights I'll point out here are the communication systems. So first off, we have this FR Sky Tyrannus RC receiver here, and that's the interface between the pilot's remote controller and the vehicle, and that receives the control inputs and forwards them to the flight control computer, which then makes the necessary uh, motor outputs. And then we also have this backup or additional uh, telemetry module here, the RFD 900 telemetry radio, and that provides us with additional range and additional data capabilities. So this streams data 
from the drone, including camera data, GPS data, so on and so forth, um, back to the ground control station laptop. And this uh, specific device extends our range to about 40 kilometers of operation, um, which is well beyond the line of sight that we require, um, but it's a nice additional backup system. And so, of course, to kind of test all the integration of these avionics with the hardware, um, we conducted an iron bird test, which for some reason it's not letting us click on. Let's try that. Never mind. Oh, this is fun. Do you want to? Okay. Well, <clears throat> there is an iron bird test, um, unfortunately. <laughs> Apparently we can't show you that, uh, I'm not sure why. But here's our, here's our actual drone. So here's Elsa, uh, the final prototype. Uh, some things to note about this is during testing, you'll, you might see a video of it flying. Um, if not, then you'll certainly see one at the posting presentation. Um, but the first few tests of our prototype were very fun. Um, they resulted in instant face planting. Um, and then, so we had to do some, some reconfiguring, some reprogramming, and um, Elsa finally learned how to control her powers, and we got her off the ground. Um, so to the right, you'll see some specs of the drone. To the left, you'll see Elsa, and let's see about this. So here is the design journey. So at the very beginning, top left, right here, um, which is no longer a laser pointer, but you'll see uh, the initial CAD. And you can see how much more detailed it got, how much better it got. And then bottom left is something really fun. So we had an issue with the ordering of our parts. We, never, we didn't get our parts until mid to late February. So for our manufacturing test review, we had to uh, get a little creative. And so with parts from, completely from the lab, we were able to make this Frankenstein, we called it Frankenstein drone, Frank for short. Um, that is just full rotor drone, we did an iron bird on this as well that showed that we are actually capable of building a drone-like system and integrating our avionics with it. So here's a flight test, which does not look like it's gonna let us do that either. So that's unfortunate. But let's talk about, so we've talked about what we have done and what we've built, what we've designed. Let's talk about what we can do in the future. So what can we use our drone for? Yep. And so if we were able to play the video, you would have seen it do a nice takeoff, fly around, deliver a payload, and land itself back onto the ground, a very nice flight. And I'm sure we'll show that to you guys at the poster presentation when you stop by. Um, but one thing that we also thought about is how can we extend the capability of this vehicle um, further moving forward? And one such thought that we want to look at exploring, provided we had a larger budget and more resources, would be uh, implementing drone swarms. Yeah, go for it. Um, and so the thought process here is our single drone is capable of lifting a three pound payload and a certain flight time, but you can leverage multiple drones in your search area in order to increase the coverage of your search area. So you can reduce the amount of time it takes to find any potential survivors in an avalanche. Further, the other portion of the concept includes a kind of joint lift capability. And so when you leverage multiple drones to lift a single payload, you now can have the thrust capabilities of more than one drone and therefore you can lift larger payloads. Um, so provided more resources, that's kind of the next step that we think this, this system can be applied to and what we'd like to look at. Um, yeah, but uh, while we're waiting on <laughs> the video to be pulled up, that pretty much concludes our presentation. So on behalf of the team, I'd like to thank everyone who supported us over the past couple of semesters. <laughs> And then you're probably getting an email. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Even uh, if you do it in the exited view, like not full screen view. Can I can I sign out? Use another account. Was it not letting me do that? Um, I don't know why. It's... Oh, that's not what we want. <laughs> Uh, I think he's meant to accept I mean, approval request. Yeah. I think he has to approve the request. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Quite fun. Yeah. We, is it the PowerPoint. Yeah, the PowerPoint didn't. Yeah. Okay, so we've got this one. It's been shared. <laughs> All right. Try it now. We're gonna test our drivers. Then you're, I'm probably also gonna have to. 
That's not ours. Oh, that's not, oh, ours. not ours. Here, I'll let you sign it. Um, can I try like a? Let me try something else. Let me try uh, sign out and then reload. I think like you guys go without saying what you guys really want for. <laughs> <laughs> going to see how embarrassing long my password is. I don't know why it did that, because it downloaded as yeah. PowerPoint. Show the. Yeah. Uh, where's drive? Do you want drive? Yeah. Oh my oh. god. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, I want to show. want to show the four second flight test. Yeah, just show the flight test. There we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> So as you'll see, I'll explain a little bit now, so that you can see a nice little takeoff here. Um, there was heavy winds um, still, but we still managed to get it off the ground. You'll see nice stable loiter here into a payload drop right there. And then uh, here you'll see, um, it's just it's good enough around. quality. Here you'll see it come around into a nice, pretty soft landing. And I will also say that landing is on a slope. So that somewhat, uh, I don't know how it landed perfectly upright, but it, it was landing on a slope, and so that mimics landing on a mountain, like you would in an avalanche. Awesome. So yeah, with that, thank you for your time. <laughs> Okay. 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 Sounds good. Um. Should one of us like stand on the other side of you just to like spread out a little better? If somebody wants to, go for it. Oh, that is a PDF. Whoa, we got a screen right here too. No, they aren't they aren't working right now. So just talk loud. Okay. Hello everyone and thank you so much for coming for our presentation. Uh, <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for coming to our presentation. We are Team Swan, and we are here today to introduce you to our drone, our Mother Goose UAV. So this is the team. I'm Lexi. I am the Project Manager and Structures Lead. Um, I'm Gregory. I'm the Systems Engineer and Stability and Control Lead. I'm Rajesh. I'm the Financial Lead and the Propulsion Lead. I'm Taha. I'm the Manufacturing Lead and the Aerodynamics Lead. I'm Jack. I'm the Safety Lead and Avionics Lead. So this is sort of the organizational structure that we have used throughout these past two semesters. So any concerns from our customers or our TA and everything, go through me and I. Make sure that my team is well informed. And if my team has any concerns, I make sure that um, the customers or the teachers are aware. So this is our need statement. The disaster relief teams have the responsibility of searching for and rescuing survivors, giving aid, and surveying damage. A quicker and safer way to accomplish these tasks is needed. So now we're going to run you through our concept of operations. This is a typical mission profile, the way that we envision it to respond to flood relief situations. Um, first, we start off with our takeoff event, where we're in our search phase. 
Uh, this includes a ground penetrating radar unit that we built in-house that will scan for survivors under debris and rubble and communicate back with the ground station. After identifying and assessing the situation, it will then return to the ground station and swap its payload for a modular supply box and deliver supplies as needed. So here's our functional block diagram. As you can see, it shows all of the interactions between each of our components within our UAV and ground station system. So here is our original design solution that we ended the fall semester with. Um, as you can see, there's some pretty basic things going on. It's a six rotor configuration. We have a component box to protect all of the internal components from water damage during the flood search. Uh, we have the landing gear as well as you cannot see it in this, but there is a payload draw module system attached to the bottom of this drone. You will see some slight changes once we get to the finalized design solution. So for our airdrop module, our manufacturing process was pretty straightforward. Uh, we designed everything using SOLIDWORKS, 3D printed it, assembled it with our motor, um, all off of the drone, and then after all of that was assembled, we slapped it right onto the airframe. So we manufactured all carbon fiber pieces in-house to help save us a little bit of money. So our base plates we made, uh, we cut them into shape and then laid them up ourselves um, and then sanded them down to get them finalized. And then our landing legs were created. We made a 3D printed mold and then we laid the carbon fiber up on the um, mold. Our first set of landing legs that we made were actually um, a little bit weaker than we had originally thought. So we just made some new ones and we actually ended up using the additional landing legs that we first made as extra stability points for our drone. The arms were also made in house. This was one of the most difficult pieces of work um, that we had to do for the actual structure of the drone. So we did this, we used a square pipe as a mold. We put parchment paper over it to prevent sticking to the mold. Um, and there was a little bit of complications with it, but we did end up getting some really nice square arms um, that were significantly cheaper than if we had purchased them um, on the market. We also created wire holdings and motor mounts that were 3D printed. Um, these not only help to control kind of what it looks like as well as attach the motors to the arm easily, it also assists in the water resistant ability of our drone. And so for the control system, uh, the manufacturing was a little less um, hard and a little more of programming side. Um, so we programmed the transmitter and the flight control computer. Uh, for our flight control computer, we used the Pixoc 2.4.8 and our transmitter was the Tyrannus QX7, and for our receiver, which communicated with our transmitter, we used the FR Sky XM Plus. Um, we had to calibrate the onboard sensors. One of the benefits of the PIXOC is that it had inertial measurement units and accelerometers already on it, so all we had to do was calibrate it to the specifications of our drone, and it pretty much did the work for us. Uh, but we had a lot of wiring and soldering that we had to do between the power points, um, because we had our PIXOC uh, sending the signals to a power distribution board in the form of a PM07, which then sent the messages to our ESCs of where to divert the power. Similar to the control system, our communication system largely consists of commercial off-the-shelf parts, which were then assembled, soldered, and programmed in-house, and then we 3D printed housings for them in order to improve their water resistance in the flood search and rescue situation. So for the GPR, the uh, ground penetrating radar, we had to build this in-house because a, uh, a component like this off the shelf goes for $40,000 just about. We can't afford that. So uh, we had to uh, use the ECE makerspace to design PCB boards for our components and then use the micro soldering station over there to get the, get the components on the board and then uh, we used uh, SMA adapters to uh, connect the coaxial cables between boards uh, just so everything would uh, communicate. And so for a verification test, we're just gonna hit some of the highlights um, for the control subsystem. Um, the main one was the range and telemetry test. Um, this is very much between the transmitter and the ground station to make sure that we can keep a constant signal throughout the line of sight requirement that the FAA regulates. Uh, to complete this test, we went to the big field at Dorothy Dix, um, and we basically had one person have the ground station and transmitter, and the other person have the receiver and the PIXOC module, and we essentially just backed up from each other, 
until we didn't have any communication between the two subsystems, and actually that never happened. Um, we more than exceeded our success criterion as we spanned the entirety of the big field and even the densely populated tree area without receiving any um, issues in communication. So for our propulsion system, um, through our research, we found out that the most common way that drone motors fail is through overheating. So we ran a temperature endurance test where we ran our motor for 20 minutes at cruising speed as determined by the thrust stand uh, shown in that picture. And as you can see from that bottom right graph, by the five minute mark, our motor maintained a 43 degree Celsius uh, steady temperature, which is well below the 80 degrees that heat becomes a problem for motors. For our communication system, the primary success criteria was identification of survivors. So uh, several tests were designed to uh, uh, facilitate uh, the communication between the ground station and uh, the vehicle. Um, so our tests were, uh, were designed to uh, evaluate qualitatively uh, the, eff the effectiveness of the communication system. And um, they were nominally successful, although there were some issues with the microphone array, which uh, have led to a redesign. So for the first verification, verification test for the GPR, we ran a Simulink MATLAB uh, simulation of it just to make sure all the components would function properly before we purchased them. Uh, as I said earlier, the biggest challenge with this uh, subsystem was the budget. Uh, we didn't have enough to buy components twice, and uh, we had to make sure everything worked properly. So we just ran this on a laptop, and uh, the simulation worked properly, and uh, we'll have it uh, playing at the uh, poster presentation. So the most important thing just about for these structures, other than the actual withholding of the drone is the waterproofing. Um, because this drone will be operating in flood conditions, any water that could get in from rain or from splashing could damage the internal components. So to make sure that our um, structures system completely is, makes the drone water resistant, we actually set up this VVNT test that, oop, sorry, that allowed for um, the water testing. This is a video. Let me see if I can. Awesome. So as you can see, there is a very heavy flow of water. We were going for a water resistance of IPX1, which is actually only a millimeter per minute. This is a lot higher than that. So um, given some other testing rigs, we could definitely get a higher IPX rating. Um, there was no water inside the component box at all. Um, so it definitely, it's very promising for future tests. So this is the final prototype. As you can see, there are some, a few differences. Uh, mainly, you'll probably notice is the goose swan design that we have going on. So almost everything on this does actually have a functional um, reason for it. So for example, the head is the GPS mount. It needs to be away from the box to give reliable data. We also added feet for stability. Um, and you can see the two additional landing legs on the front and the back of the drone for stability. You can also see our finalized payload box, which uh, we affectionately refer to as the golden goose egg. So yes, this is our final prototype. So what can our drone do? Now, because of our lightweight airplane and efficient propulsion system, in its search mode, it, can, it has a max one-way range of 3.6 miles. Uh, to put that into perspective, it can fly from here, one way, all the way to PNC Arena. Now, in its airdrop, cap in its airdrop mode, it can fly, since it's carrying um, a heavier payload, up to six pounds, um, it can fly one way uh, for 1.8 miles. Now, because of its two-way communication system, um, in conjunction with its video camera, um, it's able to create a full situation report for any flood relief teams that use our drone. Um, so it can, it will be able to let them uh, detail things like exact, exact GPS coordinates of any victims that it finds, uh, the state that they're in, 
and through the two-way communication system, um, any details that they can communicate to us. If you guys want a closer look at that victim situational assessment, we will actually have a few copies at our poster that you can take with you and kind of get a better understanding of what all our drone can really help. Now, all of this we were able to accomplish with $950. Um, and you can see with our budget pie chart, most of that cost was from the propulsion system, followed by the power and the radar system that we built in-house. Now, one of the biggest benefits we have to our flood relief customers is our cost effectiveness. Uh, because of our strategy of building every, as much as we could in-house, we were able to lower all of our costs to be, able, to be able to fit as much capability into our drone as we could. Uh, for example, our, our airframe system uh, that we were able to build uh, in-house with our um, composites that we laid up ourselves, um, our radar system that we were able to build, and our um, uh, things like our sensors, our microphone array, uh, our camera system, our speakers that we were able to, to uh, build mm -hmm. all through ourselves. And, um, Another benefit that we have is our lower resource use um, that we can offer to any flood relief teams that use our drone, whether it's a local team or a really big organization like the Coast Guard, for example. Yeah, so in the context of Coast Guard use, currently they use helicopters and boats that are very expensive, and so they have to be allocated very strategically. And oftentimes this leads to a lack of infrastructure where it's needed in the actual event of disasters. Um, with our cheaper uh, drone, we can not only buy drones for regions that may have disasters that can't otherwise receive boats or helicopters. But also, we can have more drones, allowing for a swarm capability that provides more coverage. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, the uh, commercial off-the-shelf GPRs that they do to uh, detect survivors, about $40,000. We've built one for just under 200. Not nearly as effective as the one uh, they used in Turkey, but uh, yeah, $200 is pretty good. We're proud of that. And all of this is, uh, is done while providing an added layer of safety for flood response teams, which allows them to assess the situation and uh, do it more rapidly, all the while like not getting uh, personnel into the field where they may be hurt by uh, rip currents um, and equipment may be damaged and other such situations. Um, yeah, so everything we've talked about, like he said, it uh, just allows us to have a much more rapid response for um, both the vic victims that can get things from our airdrop module as well, and also our drone with some slight modifications because it is waterproof and it has the payload drop module and the GPR, this can be modified to fit a lot of other um, disasters that could happen like tornadoes or earthquakes and help search rescues in that regard. So overall, our vehicle will revolutionize the flood response search and rescue. It integrates seamlessly with current disaster response operations. It can hold the modular payload to help the victims and the airdrop supplies to those in most in need, most that desperately need things. And it also offers enhanced survivor recognition. We can find survivors that are trapped in cars, in their houses, things that might not be found otherwise. Thank you guys so much for coming to our presentation, and we hope to see you guys later at our poster. Any video? What? Yeah, you guys have any other video on the plate? You guys have any other video on the plate? No. Okay. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, of course. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good looking drone. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks for checking on me. Yeah, I might make a reference. Thank God. Okay. I'll make a reference once I'm safe. So, you guys, let's take charge. All right. Okay. Okay, I see it. Once you have two minutes to go, just take your time. Okay. Any mic or just. Oh, all right. So, I think that has why we asked you guys to come so that you can project to this. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, good morning, guys. Uh, pizza's coming soon, so stay awake. We're close. Um, so we are Trident, uh, and I'm going to be introducing our flight vehicle, Poseidon. Um, and so Trident stands for Triple Response for Identification of Damages and Expedited Neutralization of Tragedy.
Uh, so today we're going to be going through the concept of operations and then uh, into the design solution, assembly and testing, which is where we kind of verify some of our uh, subcomponents, and then we're going to be going over our flight and then next steps. Uh, so this is us. Uh, everybody can kind of introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Michael, the project manager. Uh, I'm Michaela. I'm Michaela. I do floor and control lead. I'm Karthik. I'm the avionics lead. I'm Riley. I'm the aerodynamics and test safety lead. I'm Sean Goodworth. I'm the structures lead. All right. And so this is the organization. Um, kind of like Lexi said, it, it just leads from the customers to the TAs to me and then uh, my teammates. Uh, so. The, uh, our purpose is to build a multi-rotor vehicle uh, to assist with natural disasters. And so we chose hurricanes at, being as that's so prevalent in North Carolina. Um, and so we also chose to build a six-rotor drone. Um, and so something that we wanted to provide for the customer is a, um, a kind of reconnaissance for um, first responders so that way they can see what's actually going on before having to actually go into the storm. And so to do that, uh, we're implementing computer vision, uh, wind speed adaptive control to deal with really high winds, um, and then a novel uh, wireless charging system uh, to deal with the, uh, to kind of speed up the, the redeploy. So the outcomes that we were looking for is we wanted to provide real-time information to assist in decision making um, during three distinct phases of hurricane disaster relief. This is the pre-disaster phase. Um, this is before actual touchdown of the hurricane, um, fortifying the communities. Immediately um, post-hurricane, we want to be able to identify potential secondary ecological disasters like chemical spills or oil spills and assist in infrastructure damage analysis for rebuilding efforts um, in the weeks after the storm. So to walk you through the, our concept of operations, it's split into five separate uh, phases. The first stage is the pre-flight, uh, which we'll be going through the assembly pre-flight checklist, after which we will take off and, and ascend to our mission profile altitude, uh, maximum of uh, 400 feet EGL. After which we'll proceed to our flight mission, which will be one of three, either oil spill, debris inspection, infrastructure inspection, or assisting in search and rescue. Uh, during this phase, we'll be utilizing our computer vision and our camera system to identify survivors and cracks infrastructure, uh, as well as the ultrasonic anemometer sensor for detection of uh, wind gusts. After which, we'll be going to the landing phase, descending, landing safely, and then we'll be charging and repeating. In the charging process, we'll utilize our wireless charging technology, which we'll introduce later. So that leads us to our functional requirements. These functional requirements were given to us by our customers as well as defined by our team to help us throughout the design process. Um, to highlight a couple, uh, we have a maximum weight of 10 pounds. We had to stay under. We had to fit within a five by three by two foot area or a trunk of a sedan. And um, it just helps us with the design process and we'll get to the uh, design solution soon. And this is just a quick visual to show the functional requirements needed and the design requirements that we also defined and how they uh, go to each subsystem. Here's our functional block diagram. This is how the uh, drone communicates from the ground station to the drone itself. You can see the different subsystems, systems, and components, and how they all interact with each other by sending power relays and information. So this is our CAD model for our design solution. Uh, as you can see here, it's a lot more complex. Our initial uh, design solutions were not quite as complex, pretty simple, but. Uh, from this, you can see that the, the, uh, the total diameter of the flight vehicle is a little over three feet, or the total height of a little over uh, about a foot or so. Uh, you can see the uh, ultrasonic anemometer sensor on, on top in red, as well as the uh, um, inductance charging coil uh, for landing gear for wireless charging uh, down below, as well as a battery hammock with our CV uh, camera payload. So that leads us to our first subsystem, our propulsion system. Uh, Poseidon comes equipped with a 2212 900 kV motor, six of them. Um, 12 by 4.5 MR propellers, a 30 amp ESCs, and a 12, all powered by a 12,000 milliamp hour 4S 20C LiPo battery. Um, with this configuration, we found through simulation and testing that each rotor has about 2.2 pounds of force, so that gives us a thrust to weight ratio of about 1.95, and we were able to achieve takeoff and hover at around 55% throttle. So going through the structures for the overall design solution, we went through multiple, multiple design iterations of everything, uh, but we use two primary materials, including Hexel ASFC 3000 carbon fiber, for, and this is mainly for the motor arms and for the landing gear. Uh, then we also used uh, PLA and ABS for the 3D printed mounts, uh, all of which were custom made to fit our uh, flight components. As you can see over here, you have the hammock um, 
motor arm uh, mounts in the white, and then the uh, base plate to motor arm mounts, as well as the landing gear mounts went through multiple uh, design configurations. Uh, these were all 3D printed uh, on campus and manufactured as well. Uh, going through one of our main kind of uh, ver verification tests was the drop test. Uh, went through multiple design iterations for this. Uh, started with the FBA simulations here in ANSYS and modeling, after which we did physical testing um, of the actual landing gear once it was fabricated. Um, like most and a lot of engineering projects, uh, things did not go as planned. Um, as you can see, uh, it failed. Uh, so going forward, we uh, went through the second iteration and then we made it better. As you can see, through about a half a dozen plus different design uh, iterations, we improved the design significantly, made it much more rigid, uh, which increased the structural integrity of the landing gear and significantly improved the maximum uh, landing force that the flight vehicle could allow. So for the assembly and testing of the control system, um, the primary goals were ensuring that the system would have the, the control system would have the necessary support to supply the quality data that we really need for automation and for um, more robust decision making. So we wanted to establish effective communication infrastructure to make sure that all the peripherals are able to get that data to the control system um, in a quick and responsive time frame. Um, and developing the decision-making algorithms that show Poseidon's adaptability and ability to respond to dynamically shifting environments and um, for different mission parameters. So for the ultrasonic anemometer, um, as we previously were stating, the idea was, again, getting um, wind gust recognition and disturbance rejection. So it was fully assembled. Um, we got the 3D printed body. Um, we got all of our electronic opponent components acquired and connected. And this included a um, printed circuit board from TI um, that had the majority of the capabilities required. Um, except that it was uh, for one dimensional flow. So in order to modify this, we had to use a multiplexer. Um, so in theory, it should work, but we weren't able to test because of uh, wind tunnel access. So um, assembly testing for the Pixhawk and Raspberry Pi. So the control system um, really leans upon the use of the companion computer and our Pixhawk flight controller and we needed to ensure that these were seamlessly integrated. Um, and also that, again, that they were going to be able to have the hardware that would support um, these more advanced applications like the computer vision and the um, decision-making algorithms. So we wanted to thermal stress test the Raspberry Pi to see if we could overclock it and see how much power we can actually get out of that hardware. So we overclocked the CPU from 1.5 gigahertz, which is standard to two gigahertz, and did a stress test monitoring the thermal response, and it was always within um, operational bounds, even at really high stress levels. And then we needed to test the full integration of the avionics package, um, and this was using the MapLeak communication protocol, and we showed that the camera could produce a live stream video, um, the Raspberry Pi could analyze the images, and then send a command to the Pixhawk flight controller, which has the autopilot. So, in a moment, you'll see um, someone will talk about how during our flight test, we had a crash. Um, one of the reasons that that happened was because our drone went out of telemetry range. And looking on that, not wanting that to happen again, we started looking into solutions for how can we extend that telemetry range. So this is an onboard LTE 4G um, hat that sits on the Raspberry Pi and it extends the telemetry range to thousands of miles or anywhere that there is Wi-Fi connection. This drone can be remotely um, operated even from across the world. It's also internet of things integration um, and can be controlled through a smartphone and allows for real-time streaming. Um, the majority of this testing was just uh, AT commands, which are communication protocol, so. Sweet. Um, let's do a 10-second ad break. Uh, as you can see, the RoboFlow QR code, go ahead and try to scan it. You'll get a quick glimpse of what I've been working on. Uh, as per, unfortunately, it's Apple users only, so I don't know what to say. <laughs> So as you can see in the pictures over here, you can see that we can identify people and camera, uh, the balls and the colors as, uh, really well. So 
it took about 50 epochs, and basically 50 epochs is like, every epoch is 10 years of learning. So this computer learned for 500 years, and this is where it's at. We got a 93% uh, success rate, and it's able to identify it pretty well. Uh, this QR code is only to identify the colors and the balls and the people, but as you can see in the top right image over there, or yeah, top right image over there, it's the actual stream. So I created a hotspot on my phone, and I was able to stream the data, and as you can see, it's able to detect laptop, mouse, people, uh, it calls my phone a toothbrush. Uh, <laughs> it's still a, working, a work in progress, uh, but it's pretty successful, and it streams, and eventually we'll set up a VPN so that anyone can view it. Uh, next slide. Sweet. Induction charge. So our original intention of induction charge was to basically park, land, charge, and then keep on going so that we can continue our mission. As you can see, uh, LED, we just use a simple LED as a proof of concept. And for you non-believers out there, I put a piece of paper in between just to prove that it is induction charge and wirelessly charging. And the LED is glowing really well the closer you get to it. And we pretty much kept on uh, pushing forward to that. We're hoping to actually integrate the charge back into our battery system and power our avionics. Uh, this is our first flight. Uh, we successfully took off, had stable flight, and a structural, uh, proved our structural strength. We went up 200 feet and a distance of 1,000 feet away from base. But as you can see in the second picture of the impending doom that was about to happen, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we unfortunately crashed our drone into the forest. I had to crawl through a lot of bamboo. <laughs> but uh, we found our drone successfully, and we kind of proved that it can take a quite a big tumble, uh, almost 100 feet drop, uh, 45 minutes of heavy rain, and it was still working afterwards. I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, we'll keep working on our landing, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, so you notice all our hair is pretty wet. We were <laughs> walking through the rain for like 45 minutes to find it. Um, so next step, so we have scheduled uh, a new test flight. Uh, some people said Wednesday, maybe Saturday. Um, but we had to order new motors because they were damaged from the water and from the shock. Uh, new ESCs that were also damaged. And then we had to reprint a couple 3D printed parts that uh, took a little bit of a beating. Um, but in this iteration, we're going to go for a more stable landing with the, the new landing gear that we made. Uh, uh, better directionality because one of the motor arm mounts has uh, a different color. So you can kind of see a little bit better when you're flying it. Um, and then safe flight from a more like controllable height. Um, so yeah, Jimmy V had something right about, uh, yeah, don't give up, don't ever give up, because two weeks ago I thought we were done, and these guys kept us through it, and we did really well. Um, so to conclude, that's a little picture of our drone flying away. Um, <laughs> Into the forest. <laughs> Before it crashed. Yeah. <laughs> we thought it was successful at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's everything. Thank you, Dr. Ure. Thank you, Mahedi. And thank you all at MAE Department. Mahedi! <laughs> So you guys have 12 minutes and um, mm -hmm. that's good. So once you have two, two minutes to go, just say two. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. Take uh, chance. I mean, you guys can project to this. This microphone? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yep. So I have 12, 14, 18, and then the last final. Yep. Bit. I'll take care of whatever's left. Yeah. All right. So yes. You want, you want to do the clicker? Um, I can. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. Um. 
Hi, we're Stellar Propellers, and this is our complete design overview. Our presentation outline, we're going to go through our personnel, our project scope, our design requirements, proposed design solution, some of the manufacturing we did and testing we did, our final design solution, and then some statistics and next steps at the end. Uh, I'm Hayne Beard. I'm the systems engineering lead. Uh, I'm Luke Wiffelgren. I'm the test and safety lead. I'm Paul Randolph. I'm your manufacturing lead for this team. Hi. I'm Ashtush. I'm the project and communication lead for this team. I'm Spencer Martindale, and I'm the finance lead. Uh, this is just a brief overview of our organizational structure from Dr. Uwere down to Mahdi, uh, some of our customers over there on the right, and then how our group broke down with AC being our team lead and then our specific roles. And our mission statement, the Stellar Propeller airframe is envisioned as a battery-powered aircraft with the capacity for multimodal flight, visual reconnaissance, and payload delivery. It encompasses precise control of propellers with a diverse orientation, the seamless integration of deployable payload system, and real-time video streaming feed authorized users via radio to a frequency feed for them. And our project description, we are actively exploring uh, innovative solutions for delivering natural disaster relief through the integration of advanced multi-rotor technologies, leveraging rapid deployability, interchangeability, and advantages inherent in multi-rotor drones, as well as our uh, multimodal flight. And our aim is to significantly diminish those crucial response times with the multimodal flight capability. So next up, we're going to talk about the purpose. And our purpose is just our needs and solutions. So our first need is we need to be able to respond quickly to our natural disaster. And again, going into our solution, uh, this is just to make our drone easy to deploy. And because we're responding to natural disasters, we need to have some kind of situa situational analysis. And so our situational analysis, what we decided on, was to be able to locate survivors and then also to be able to survey what happened, the effects of the natural disaster. And because we're locating survivors, we need to be able to provide some kind of aid to these um, different survivors. And because of this, uh, our solution is just uh, uh, supplying aid upon need and then the, the urgency of what it needs to be supplied. Uh, lastly, because time is of the essence, we need to be able to efficiently search. And because of this, we're just going to increase our range and efficiency. And one of the ways that we're doing that is to convert from uh, VTOL into a more conventional flight. And some of our goals and objectives overlap with the previous slide, so I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, our first goal is just to utilize a camera system, and this is just to be able to allow us to locate survivors in the natural disaster. Again, making it more efficient to search for uh, the survivors. Our second goal, because we're locating survivors again, we need to be able to supply some kind of aid to these survivors. So our objective is to, de to, to deliver a payload to these survivors based upon need again. And then lastly, uh, just reducing that survivor locating time again, making it more efficient. So we're going to maximize power and efficiency by using that conventional flight, like we stated. Uh, so here you can see an idealized level three concept of operations. Uh, the first step would be a uh, one to two man team takes the drone out either by car or light truck uh, to a location where they can assemble the drone and potentially a ground station involving controllers, monitors, communication equipment. Um, once the drone is completed, uh, it will lift off uh, either autonomously or by uh, flight controller um, and take flight via VTOL. Um, and then once at an a acceptable altitude, it would transition into forward flight, um, maximizing efficiency, flight time, range, etc. cetera. Um, after transitioning into forward flight, it would then execute either a pre-programmed pre efficient search pattern or be flown manually by that ground team. Uh, in the process looking for survivors, uh, surveying uh, damage, or surveying just uh, what happened after the uh, natural disaster. Um, upon location of survivors, the drone has multiple options. It could either tag the survivor uh, with GPS, um, either relay it back to ground control, or store it uh, in its onboard memory. Um, and then if need be, um, transition back into VTOL flight, drop the payload off to the survivor, <laughs> transition back into forward flight, uh, and then either complete a search pattern um. <laughs> Too big for this place. <laughs> Is there another one? Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So transition back into forward flight. Um, complete the search pattern, or uh, return to the ground station, or perhaps another location for either uh, battery replacement, um, another pay payload replacement, um, or any other needs that may be required. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, here you can see our functional block diagram. Uh, this is uh, how all of our subsystems are intertwined, how they work together, uh, the various components, and how they're controlled. And here's our proposed design solution. And the top image you can see is the completed design with all the painted wings. And at the bottom you can see it's the hollow structure showing all the assembly pieces of our rig spar and electronics that would be placed. And that's our main uh, super joint, which would hold all our uh, structural members together. So if our first step in our manufacturing process was something we like to call the super joint assembly. This is one central assembly that takes away any sort of extraneous hardware and um, mechanical securement between our um, frame members. So our vehicle is uh, bisymmetric, which means you can cut it in half and both sides are the same. So there are two super joints on the vehicle. These include um, PLA printed interfaces, carbon fiber members, Teflon additions, and they are sandwiched between two aluminum plates. Um, these plates are tightened together with screws and it forms kind of a multi-material composite of sorts. The challenges for this were that the landing gear holes were not cut at an angle since it was water jet cut, it was cut perfectly planar at 90 degrees and that had to be manually machined out later. Here's the structural frame and landing gear assembly. So for this we had to cut carbon fiber members and uh, press fit into, um, into the super joint and for that we used Teflon contact tape and assembled it by inserting the rods and our landing gear caps that were fully 3D printed and attached with resin. And the challenges with this was uh, having the super joint landing um, into the holes and attaching it to the carbon fiber because of the mm -hmm. angled cuts we had to make ourselves, which uh, had to be adjusted a lot. And it was difficult to do it, so, and just redesign it any time it broke off. So, yeah. so the, the first time we had made a super joint, we cut it out of quarter inch aluminum. And after putting the two super joints together and massing them and realizing that each single super joint weighed more than all of the carbon fiber and the rest of the frame, we realized that we do not need a quarter inch of metal and we only need about an eighth of an inch of metal. Mm -hmm. So the super joint was redesigned to accompany this much thinner material on the edges. So next in our manufacturing process was the propulsion system. So for this, we had to solder leads, receiver, ESC, and motors to the flight computer, general, FPV, hobby drone things. Uh, we 3D printed our motor mounts. We connected those with M3 screws to our motors, as you can see in the middle image. Um, we bound the receivers and transmitters together. This gave me a fit of a time because the receivers and transmitters are on two different versions of firmware that are compatible with the US and European um, regulations. So between faulty equipment, software tuning, finding equipment, appropriate mount sizing, and European firmware reflashing, this was a rather difficult, annoying, and painstaking process. And here's the assembly for our lifting bodies and spars. Um, all our pieces were completely 3D printed and aligned uh, on our super joint assembly and lined across um, on the super carbon fiber member. And mm -hmm. they were attached using resin. And the body was center body was printed with um, um, and attached with resin around the frame. Um, and there was the screw holes which mounted onto the super joint to hold it structurally fit in there. And the hardest part about this was adjusting the tolerancing for 3D printing because of different 3D printers we were using. Uh, and then going on to those, some of those verification tests for the landing simulation test, we imported our model from Fusion 360 into just one of the legs, created a, a static base, and applied a, a landing speed on either leg with the center of gravity estimated, and you can see in the image, for where the actual center of gravity on the completed uh, aircraft would be. And then we tested it three different speeds, five meters per second, 10 meters per second, 20 meters per second. And when we were tested at 10 meters per second, we stayed in within our kind of desired range of a factor of safety of about two for what we thought would cause serious, serious damage and like alter our plane to a point where it was not flyable or safe to fly anymore. And from there, we just uh, eliminated. So our landing criteria was pretty much from there, just try and land it under 10 meters per second. Yep. So next up, we're gonna talk about our verification test for our uh, cameras and also our geotagging uh, verification test. So these verification tests happen at the same time. Uh, we just connected our geo locator to the receiver as, as well as our cameras. And then we just relayed that footage back to our computer just to see uh, what kind of uh, images were displayed and then also the location accuracy. So again, our goal was to verify the image quality, uh, making sure that none of our transmissions interfered with each other and that we would be able to fly on flight test day. So our results were that we could see up to roughly 60 meters, and then also our GPS accuracy was up to about two meters, which is pretty good. Uh, so we also conducted a hover slash battery endurance test. Um, the purpose of this was to determine total hover time um, and ensure that battery life is appropriate, as well as just to test the stability of the drone itself. Um, we had a bunch of issues with that. Uh, first, first thing we encountered was 
uh, lack of stability uh, through drift. Uh, the drone tended to not want to keep its position. Um, and through some settings and PID tuning, we tried to fix that. That ended up resulting in uh, oscillations, um, pretty extreme, and they got worse and worse to the point where we had to land it and popped off a couple landing gear. Um, <laughs> thankfully, we were able to learn a lot, uh, both with the tuning and the settings, um, and it ended up being the most simple solution, which was screw down your flight controller. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, as the pilot for this team, over our last three attempts, all of our flights were a success, and we had an average battery life of around nine minutes. And next, uh, for our air dynamics test to verify the capability of our wing and structures, we um, uh, tested it on ANSYS and Flystream to get the lift and drag for forward flight, and also make it quantify the trim and stall conditions for the flight. And um, based on the results for these testings, we got re the met required design and functional requirements, mm -hmm. and it also led to more efficient and versatile flight controls. So here is our final design solution. Um, you can see both the painted and unpainted versions of this aircraft. On our first flight test at the Mid Pines flight range, um, we only had an unpainted aircraft as we had just finished putting it together for the first time for its maiden voyage into the sky. Um, after we had applied all of our experimental design learnings with our, um, our new PID rates, our new control algorithms, our new controller settings. Um, so that was our final design solution. And then here is our first flight test at, on, or at Mid Pines at the flight day, the same flight day you've heard about with the infamous winds and crosswind gusts and not favorable conditions for anyone to want to learn to fly in. So we uh, took off, we, and, um, we executed a multi-role maneuver to move out into the main test range, and then we tried to execute as many different types of control maneuvers as we could before we were uncomfortable with the level of stability of our vehicle and chose to um, land it, and it uh, tipped a little bit forward, but overall we had a rather successful landing. So our final design uh, statistics is that the, we the vehicle weight is 10 pounds, our maximum weight ceiling in the multi-rotor section, our endurance is around nine minutes with our current battery, our thrust to weight ratio is two and a half in both the upward and forward directions, our wingspan is 58 inches, our static margin is 10%, and our CLCD at our trim speed is around 19. Uh, so some potential goals uh, and uh, steps moving forward that we would like to do would be to implement control surfaces for our wing. That includes uh, trim tabs and ailerons, as well as to reskin our wing with ultra coat mm -hmm. um, for a uh, firmer airfoil shape. Um, we also would like to fully implement the payload deployment mechanism um, as it was uh, created but not fully attached. Uh, we'd also like to fine tune the forward flight controller, uh, ideally to get some kind of smart stability system in there. Um, to ease uh, transition from VTOL to forward flight and add a second downward facing HD camera for better survivor location. Yep. Uh, so we'd like to, oh. um, that is all we have for you today from Team Stellar Propellers. Uh, thank you for your time. And to everyone here that is guest, we are the last presentation for today of the symposium. <laughs> so thank you for spending your longly awaited day since 8.30 in the morning with us and looking over all of our projects. Thank you. We're at 1258, so we did good. I'm getting my flash drive. All right, so um, just a quick announcement. The flight teams, so it's going to be Saturday, 10 a.m., and Gray is going to be there, OK? Uh, I'll still send an email about that. So uh, Saturday, 10 a.m., all right? Uh, thank you all for listening. As you can tell, there's still a lot of information to be passed on, all right? So uh, let's all head over straight now to lunch. First floor atri atrium, uh, EB3, and then uh, we'll have a symposium uh, poster and video session starting at 1.30 p.m. Thank you.